Should I? Yeah. The live stream. Go over time. This is a test. Test of the seven circuit cover appeals live stream. One, two, one, two. It says that it's offline. Oh, we are live.
Good morning, everyone. Our first case today is Gilbank versus Wood County Depri Department of Human Services. Case number, let's see, 221037. Uh, Mr. Diedrich. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Joseph Diedrich for the appellant. Federal courts are courts of constitutionally and statutorily limited jurisdiction. Federal courts also have an unflagging obligation to properly exercise that jurisdiction when it is called upon. The district court here transgressed these principles in two directions. First, the district court incorrectly held that it lacked jurisdiction under the Rooker-Feldman doctrine. Second, the district court improperly assumed hypothetical jurisdiction and issued an advisory opinion on the merits. This court should therefore reverse in part, vacate in part, and remand. Turning first to the Rooker-Feldman issue, the US Supreme Court made clear in Exxon that Rooker-Feldman is a narrow doctrine that applies only when the relief and injury elements are satisfied. Specifically, a federal plaintiff must complain of injury caused by a state court judgment, not by the conduct of an adversary. And second- Mr. So Diedrich, let's look, take a look at the first, let's look at the claim one. And so there's several 1983 violations alleged in that violation. So if we could just jump straight to, let's look at the Fourth Amendment. And so let's talk through why Ricker Feldman, in your opinion, would not apply to the, I, I believe we've agreed to the seizure as well as, or the probable cause determination, I guess, or the compelled your analysis. So maybe talk us through which claims did not apply. Uh, yes, Your Honor. So Rooker-Feldman does not apply to any of the claims. Okay. It appears the defendants have conceded that the urinalysis related search and the unconstitutional questioning without an attorney present claim do not fall within Rooker-Feldman's amb ambit. Then there's another claim about the unlawful seizure of TEH without a warrant and without uh, lawful justification. That's Rooker the Feld August 21 seizure? Excuse me, Your Honor? You're referring to the seizure on August 21, at least when she went to the, her father's custody? Uh, correct, Your Honor, that, the day of the arrest, yes. Okay. Could, uh, could, and, I ask, and, could I ask you to identify any injuries that you think uh, the plaintiff is alleging that occurred after the August 23rd, 2018 court order putting the child in the custody of her father? Your Honor, I, I may not be perfectly clear on the dates, but there are due process claims related. August 23rd was the court order, right? That's two days after the arrest and the seizure, correct? That, that court order only determined that there was probable cause to seize the child initially under the Wisconsin Children's Code. He's trying to direct you what injuries resulted that you're alleging occurred after that August 23rd date. Correct, and that the, the, the Children's Court proceeding then went on and there was evidence submitted and one of Ms. Gilbank's claims is for due process violations for uh, based on submitting false and incomplete information about Ms. Gilbank and about Mr. Hoyle. That tracks closely to the claim uh, submitted in the Bear v. Campbell case from the 11th sorry, Circuit. I'm, sorry, let me, I, I need to go back. I'm, I'm looking at the August 23rd order which you said determines only probable cause. It's called order for temporary physical custody. Yes, sir. What am I missing? I, I, perhaps, I, perhaps you're missing nothing. Uh, so let me go back to my question. What injury does plaintiff allege she, she suffered after this court order was entered? She might not be alleging any I don't any see injury. one. I, I, frankly, I don't see one either, Your Honor. Thank okay. Um, because that seems to me to have pretty serious implications for Rupert Feldman. Um, even if you don't think the state courts were fair, even if you don't think they gave her sufficient notice for that hearing, for example. Um, what do you, do you think a plaintiff, or the, the, somebody who's a defendant in state court who has an ex parte temporary restraining order against them, um, say shutting down their business or um, 
let's say stopping, let's say stopping and enforcing a non-compete or something like that. Do you think they can go into federal court and get an order setting that aside or seek damages because they did not get proper notice before the TRO was entered? Potentially, Your Honor. Do you think so? Uh, well, yes, it depends on both the chronology and a comparison of the relief requested. So the chronology matters because if you compare the facts in this case versus the facts in the Swartz v. Heartland equine relief case, they are reversed. There, the probable cause determination and a judicial order came before the government officers seized the horses. And, and so Rooker-Feldman applied there. Here, the, the causation is reversed. And as this court made clear in the Jensen v. Foley case, when a, a judicial court later on approves of the probable cause, later on, that we, doesn't. We, just, we were just looking at this, though. That order does not just determine there was probable cause to take the child into custody. It orders custody going forward, correct? Uh, correct, Your Honor. Okay. Um, so focusing on the question of relief, um, if, if a party goes into federal court seeking just damages, is that sufficient in your view to avoid Rooker-Feldman if all of the other criteria are met? It, it depends on what the relief was in the state court. So here, for instance, I agree with Your Honor that the state court adjudicated probable cause and custody going forward. Here, Ms. Gilbank does not seek any order reversing or modifying or saying anything about custody whatsoever. She doesn't care at all about the state court order at this point. She has the child. She's Precisely, Your Honor. She's not seeking review yep. and relief from the state court order at all. She says, I don't care about the state court order. Precisely. And that's element four of the ExxonMobil test. Precisely. Yes. And so in a, in a case, Your Honor, just to return to your question briefly, where the relief is injunctive, for instance, and we, we come to the federal court and the request for a reversal of that injunction would be moot, then a damages request based on the conduct of, of officers would be sufficient to make Rooker-Feldman inapplicable. How about just, but all she's seeking is damages, right? Correct. And you think that's sufficient to get her out from under this? In this case, yes. Why? Why in this case? It's because she does, she does not seek appellate review and relief from the state court custody order. She okay. is com but she is seeking damages for an injury inflicted by the state court orders, correct? That's what you told me earlier. There's no other injury after that court order. I, I don't agree that the injury was inflicted by the court order. I agree that the, I, I, I'm saying that the injury was inflicted by conduct that began and was committed by the defendants before the court order. What are those? The, the social workers and the police officers doing, uh, taking the child, um, uh, doing the urinalysis, doing the questioning without an attorney present, submitting the false information in support of that judicial petition. All of these claims relate to the conduct of the social workers and the police officers. And the Bear v. Campbell- So the constitutional violations are the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment that happened and, before- And 14th Amendment, And yes, the, the due process. Yes. So the, the contention is after August 23rd, there are no injuries beyond that. Uh, correct, Your Honor. And, and certainly no injuries caused by the order itself as opposed to conduct caused by conduct of the officers. And, and Bear v. Campbell makes it clear that the injury has to be caused by the judgment itself, not by the defendant's conduct, even if that conduct occurs during judicial proceedings, or even if that conduct also leads to the state court judgment. The, um, what do you do with the many Seventh Circuit cases that apply Rooker-Feldman to damages claims? I would, I would say we have to analyze each one of them and look, does the relief requested require this court to, or the lower federal court to exercise appellate jurisdiction? And in and some- how do we recognize that? In, well, if the state court ordered a damages remedy, for instance, and the plaintiff then comes to federal court asking for the federal court to amend that judgment, reduce the damages award, that would be a situation where the federal court is exercising appellate jurisdiction. Yes, that's the, that's the easy case. 
Okay. How about, um, uh, well, uh, how about this case where the argument is uh, the state court denied me due process of law, went forward and determined custody of my child without notice to me, um, and then made bad decisions, um, putting my child in danger. Um, and I want damages for that. You told me at the beginning of this argument you could not identify any injuries plaintiffs suffered after that court order was entered that would be independent of that court order, right? Well, respectfully, Your Honor, I, I disagree. And if I communicated otherwise, uh, I, I retract that. The, tell, the, tell me what injuries plaintiff suffered, is alleging she suffered, after the August 23rd court order. She did not suffer additional injuries beyond that. She suffered injuries before that court order and she's claiming she lost custody of her child for a year, right? Uh, correct, Your Honor. And all but two days of that was with the blessing of the court orders, correct? There was the, the conduct that led to the injury was precipitated by the conduct of the officers and the social workers. If that conduct also leads to a would state she court have been order, injured? Would she have been injured without the court orders? Yes, Your Honor. Tell me how, when, how and when. She was separated from the child. Uh, she has a constitutional injury resulting from the unlawful search related to the urine sample, the mm -hmm. unlawful questioning, the submission of false and incomplete information, the conspiracy claim. How all of this the, occurred. How did, the, how did the false information, first of all, I want you to tell, tell me how you think it hurt her apart from the court order. And then second, tell me, tell us what you think the false information was. The, the false information and, and incomplete information related to the information specifically in the judicial um, uh, petition for the child protective services order. And that was submitted before the court order. It was submitted by uh, the social workers and the police officers. We're, and I want to refer back to the Bear v. Campbell case, which talked about the exact same claim in, in a child custody proceeding. Yes, and Bear is very difficult to reconcile with Seventh Circuit precedent. Mm -hmm. You want us to split and go in the direction of the Eleventh Circuit? Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't necessarily agree that it's difficult to reconcile, Your Honor. We, we cited in our briefing eight child custody cases, including multiple from this circuit, including the recent cases in Royal and Sanders, as well as the older case of Brokaw, all three from this circuit that address very similar situations and hold that Rooker-Feldman does not apply to the child custody cases where the state court determined child custody, the plaintiff in federal court does not dispute that or ask for appellate review from that. I'd like to save the remainder of my could time. I, could I ask you, though, to tell us what you think the false and misleading information was? The, the false and informa misleading information is identified in the complaint. I, I, I refer your honor there. It, it relates to her use of drugs and potentially other things. I, I don't have that in front of me right now, and I, I apologize for that. OK. I mean, I, 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 I know you, you, you all took this case on at our request, and we're very grateful for the help you've provided. And I know that that was a pro se complaint, and I understand you're not necessarily you didn't draft it. <laughs> and, and, and just one more thing on that point, Your Honor. Whether the information was false or inaccurate is a merits question that has nothing to do with, with Rooker Feldman. And that, that would get into our second point about the hypothetical jurisdiction and the advisory opinion. On that point, with my colleague's indulgence, and I, Mr. Dietrich, I want to ask you, I would agree with you that the district court opinion and judgment are at least ambiguous. And they're kind of confusing about what's merits, uh, what's jurisdiction, um, and the district judge was not drawing the line. Defendants are drawing now between the, the August 23rd order and earlier claims and so on. I wonder, in a number of situations, we have cleaned up such matters, basically, um, where um, and, and, and modified judgments. And I wonder whether your argument doesn't basically just ask us to assume the worst about the district judge's approach to the case rather than give him the benefit of the doubt. 
So there's, there's one telltale sign that makes this case different from those other cases. The district court explicitly used the word, even if I, quote, assumed that Rooker-Feldman doesn't apply. And then he proceeded to adjudicate or, or render an opinion on everything else. Assume is the very word that the US Supreme Court identified in the Steel Company case as what district courts are not permitted to do. This court has said in the Leibovich case that when uh, a district court improperly, I see my time is up, may I finish my answer? When, when a, a district court exercises hypothetical jurisdiction, all this court can do is vacate that opinion because it is ultra vires and void. And therefore, the, all that comes up here is a without prejudice judgment based on the lack of jurisdiction. The defendants had to file a cross appeal if they wanted to enlarge that judgment to one with prejudice based on the merits. They Where did does not the judgment say it's without prejudice? It, it doesn't, Your Honor. So right. we look at Rule 41B and the case law interpreting it. The only valid part of that judgment is for lack of subject matter jurisdiction because the rest of the judgment was under hypothetical jurisdiction. Thank All right, thank you, Mr. Dieter. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay, who's, who's first? Ms. Ms. Cora? May it please the court. My name is Anit Kaur, and I represent the Wood County defendants in this matter. Um, along with me is attorney Jason Just. He represents the Marshfield defendants. Um, I will be addressing um, just very briefly the 1985 portion and the Rooker-Feldman argument. And then attorney Just is going to, rep um, to address the second piece, um, which is that the district court in this case exercised actual jurisdiction, not hypothetical jurisdiction as to um, those claims which Ms. Gilbank was asserting were independent. And at the end of our argument, we would ask that the court affirm the district court's decision. Specifically, we would ask that the court find that the district court correctly applied the Rooker-Feldman doctrine to Ms. Gilbank's claims arising out of the state court custodial decision and dismissed her other claims on the merits. Could I ask you about ExxonMobil and the language that the court used in ExxonMobil? The way uh, ExxonMobil has been interpreted, it, it can be interpreted at least um, after, this, after the colon. Cases brought by state court losers complaining of injuries caused by state court judgment rendered before the district court proceedings commenced and inviting district court review and rejection of those judgments. That and, okay, I'm troubled by that and. That and seems to me to indicate another element, which is inviting district court review and rejection of those judgments. But it seems to me that you're reading the and as just part of the injury element, that if the injuries are derived from the state court judgment, then necessarily the plaintiff is um, arguing that the district court must review and reject the state court judgment. That's correct, Your Honor. That's how I interpret the ExxonMobil decision. I don't interpret that one sentence as a test. I look at the whole decision and subsequent decisions thereafter. And based on those decisions and the Seventh Circuit's decisions, it's clear that we're looking at the injury. Someone who's complaining that they were injured by a state court decision is necessarily asking the district court to review and reject that decision. And so, and that's the exact reason why I believe that the Seventh Circuit's current test is completely aligned with Supreme Court precedent, both ExxonMobil and subsequent decisions after that. Um, Ms. Gilbank has proposed an entirely new test in this case, and that test is inappropriate. Her test, again, focuses on the one sentence in ExxonMobil, and that's not appropriate. We have to look at the entire decision. And if we look at the entire decision, the court went on to say in that case, in ExxonMobil, that um, the doctrine also applies to those cases which, which are essentially inviting review and rejection of the lower court decision. And then in Lance, another decision, um, another Supreme Court decision, excuse me, uh, from 2006. Counsel, do you agree that the Fourth Amendment claim for the urinalysis and the seizure prior to August 22nd I believe 
Correct. That that would not have fallen under the Exxon Mobil Rooker Feldman explanation. And so, Your Honor, if this wasn't clear in my in our briefing, um, it depends on the claim that Miss Gilbank is asserting based on that UA. And so, what I mean by that is the way that I interpret the district court's decision is the district court looked at that UA claim and said, to the extent that she's claiming that that UA caused an injury later on. I'm asking, on, though, in your briefing, did you agree that it doesn't fall under Rooker Feldman? Yes, Your Honor, if she's complaining of an independent injury, that okay. the UA itself was was unlawful and we shouldn't have done it, then it does. But the if argument she's, is that she did not consent. Correct. That That is Ms. Gilbank's argument, that she did not consent. Correct. And the district court addressed that on the merits and... Um, Quite frankly, that was just a baseless allegation. Um, there was testimony from her afterwards um, agreeing that it was voluntary, that she had consented. Um, she admitted that in her in the proposed findings of fact. Um, and so that was addressed on the merits. But on that UA analysis, the district court looked, gave her the benefit of doubt and said, to the extent that she's making an independent claim. I'm sorry, let me this, try to rephrase my question. Is it your position that the court erred in finding that Rooker Feldman applied to that analysis? To no. Gilbank's claim? No, I do not believe the district court erred. Okay, and to explain to me why not. Um, so the court looked at that, that conduct, the UA, in two separate ways. So to the extent, Ms. Gilbank's com complaint was confusing, and the court said, to the extent that she's claiming that the injury that this UA caused was the removal of her daughter, then it falls under Rooker-Feldman. But giving her the benefit of doubt, and if she's claiming that this UA was a separate injury in itself that they shouldn't have that they had no basis to ask her for the UA that it wasn't voluntary in that case it's addressed on the merits so so the court addressed in two separate ways That's so the I first read. way if it involves the state court determination of probable cause Rooker Feldman applies if it was a violation of the Fourth Amendment for a legal search which is what Gilbank has argued continuously then you agree that it should have been decided on the merits. I agree that it should Do have been. Do you think that the district court reached the merits? Yes, the and district court did. And where, what basis? Because the argument that counsel has made is that when they made the decision that Rooker Feldman applied to all of her claims, then therefore going to the merits, you know, there was advisory. The court can't consider it. So the court, um, if you if you read the first and last portion of the court's decision, the court says most of her claims are dismissed on the Rooker-Feldman doctrine. And then the court goes on to address the UA, the Fifth Amendment claim, and the due process claims independently. And the I think on page uh, 13 of the appendix, it says, but even if I assumed that Gilbank suffered injuries that were not caused by or instructively related to the state court's decision, and then we go on from there. The argument we heard from counsel is that because of that sentence, everything beyond that becomes advisory. Direct me to where that statement does not foreclose the rest of the district court's analysis. So, um, counsel, actually, that's one piece that I wanted to address. But what, because what counsel said is, the court said, even if I assumed that the Rooker-Feldman doctrine did not apply, as you just read, Your Honor, that's not what the court said. The court said, even if I assumed that Gilbank suffered injuries that were not caused by or intertwined with the state court's decision, then those claims are also dismissed on the merits. That's what I read. Correct. And then the court goes on to discuss the, the UA and then the questioning and then the due process claims on the merits. And so, again, the court is looking at these as giving her the benefit, benefit of the doubt. Is she, if she's claiming that these were separate independent injuries aside from the state court judgment, then they're addressed on the merits. So some of the claims were dismissed with prejudice, some were dismissed without prejudice. Yes, Your Honor. Some of the claims were dismissed with prejudice. And we have to read between the lines on the judgment. That's what I'm asking. Which is which, <laughs> right? <laughs> we do that sometimes for district courts who are busy and dealing with a complicated mess of a, of a, of a pro se complaint here about a very serious matter for this woman, right? I, I, don't, I don't disagree with that. I agree that we do sort of have to, um, we do have to uh, read between the lines, as you said, Your Honor. Ms. Corkin, I, I want to go back to ExxonMobil, and I want to ask you for your reaction to something. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read again what the, the, way, the way the court wrote it. Cases brought by state court losers complaining of injuries caused by state court judgments were rendered before the district court proceedings commenced and inviting district court's review and rejection of those judgments. That's the way the court wrote it. This is the way you read it. 
Cases brought by state court losers complaining of injuries caused by state court judgments rendered before this district court proceedings commenced, period. Why would the Supreme Court write and inviting district court review and rejection of those judgments if they didn't mean it? I understand I understand that, Your Honor. But again, I don't read that sentence to be a test. I read it to be a summary of the underlying decisions, not a specific, this is exactly what has to be. It's where I struggle with Rooker-Feldman is it's very, very narrow. It's never been applied except to Mr. Rooker and Mr. Feldman. It's very, very narrow. And plaintiff has a difficult case here. And there are all kinds of other doctrines that may bounce her out of court. I'm just not sure that we should read that test out of ExxonMobil and apply Rooker-Feldman maybe as broadly as we have in the past. I think that this is the exact type of case, Your Honor, where Rooker-Feldman does apply. But she's saying, I get the injury point. But her point is, I could care less about the order. The child is back with me. I don't care about the district court's order. And what we're doing is we're conflating injuries. So we're saying the injuries must invite district court review and rejection of those judgments. And therefore, the injuries and the other prong are conflated into one. And I'm having trouble seeing how they're not two instead of one. Because in order to get one, we have to read that entire clause right out of the Supreme Court's opinion. I think we have to read the opinion as a whole and subsequent opinions thereafter. My time is up. May I finish? Yes, oh yes. And the focus is on the injury piece. Because when you look at the injury, you can see that they're ultimately asking you to review and reject the opinion. While Ms. Gilbank says that's not what she's doing, she is. The Supreme Court says nothing about seeking monetary damages. It simply relates to review and rejection. You have to review and reject the underlying state court decision. If the court may allow me to just follow up, though. If the injury is the Fourth Amendment, Fifth and Fourteenth, and he says nothing beyond that, my injury is the urinalysis, the seizure without probable cause, and then the lack of the Fifth Amendment as far as lack of consent to that. If those are the injuries, those are the constitutional violations that occurred prior to the court's determination. So two parts to that, Your Honor. That's contrary to her complaint. In her complaint, it's very clear what her injuries are. She lists them explicitly. Her injuries are the separation from her child. The anxiety. The anxiety caused by it. The placement with Hoyle. The potty regression that was caused by that. All of those are injuries caused by the state court judgment. Here, the district court did exactly what it should have done. It gave Pro Se Gilbank the benefit of doubt and said, to the extent, Ms. Gilbank, that you're claiming you had some independent injury, that the UA, the questioning, then those are dismissed on the merits. Not under Rooker-Feldman, on the merits. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Just. May it please the court. My name is Jason Just. I represent the Marshfield defendants, Detective Iverson, and the Marshfield Police Department. The district court did not engage in hypothetical jurisdiction. Rooker-Feldman is a claim-by-claim analysis, and the district court engaged in such an analysis, holding that five of Ms. Gilbank's eight identifiable claims were barred by the Rooker-Feldman doctrine. Drawing all reasonable inferences in her favor, the district court acknowledged that Ms. Gilbank may have asserted three claims that were independent of these state court proceedings. Those were the warrantless year analysis, the Fifth Amendment violation, and then the broad and general due process violations. In doing so, the district court exercised actual jurisdiction and analyzed each of those claims on their merits, addressing a variety of meritorious defenses that were fully briefed and raised by the defendants, such as absence of a constitutional claim, issue preclusion, insufficiency of evidence, and failure to state a claim. Because the claims were dismissed on the merits, no enlargement of rights were sought, and cross-appeals were not necessary, as Ms. Gilbank argued for the very first time in her reply brief. 
when issues are fully briefed, especially during summary judgment, upholding dismissal on alternative grounds, as this court has already acknowledged today, uh, is consistent with this court's past precedent, such as in O'Brien v. Caterpillar, where the court held that it may affirm a judgment on any ground supported by the record, so long as the issue was adequately raised in the district court and the opposing party had the opportunity to contest it. That's what do we do, Mr. Hurst, with the, with the, Mr. Jess, I apologize, with the allegation that gets in the reply brief, the Lourd case stops us, stops us from being able to provide greater relief than what was requested um, or what was provided by the district court below. The argument by Ms. Gilbank is that below, this case was dismissed without prejudice. Issue preclusion, qualified immunity, anything beyond that without you filing a cross appeal doesn't allow this court to review those arguments. And I believe there's leaning on the Jennings case out of the Supreme Court. That's simply not the case here, Your Honor. The district court's uh, opinion is um, not concisely written, as this court's already discussed, and we do need to read between the lines a bit. But the court went on for two pages to analyze these additional issues outside of the five claims that were identified as being barred by the Rooker-Feldman Doctrine, analyzed each of them on their merits, um, and generally upheld the uh, granted the defendant's motions for summary judgment. And but would you agree that there are portions of the court's opinion that make quite clear it intends to address the merits? I'm looking at the, the first paragraph. The other injuries about which Gilbank complains were either already addressed by the state juvenile court or are not constitutional violations. That sounds to me like a merits call. Correct. And I believe the fact And the, the judgment court- just says dismissed. So, Correct. I, okay. mean, I, I believe the court, you know, there was a reason the court went on for two full pages to analyze these three claims and held there was a lack of evidence. There's no constitutional violation for the Fifth Amendment claim because no information from that interrogation was used against her in a criminal proceeding, and the Fifth Amendment does not apply to state child uh, proceedings. Um, so even though the court does not say... And the same with the Fourth Amendment in the, in the sense that there was no additional Miranda questionings regarding the criminalizing of the possession of methamphetamine or use of methamphetamine. It was more so the custody, where the temporary custody of a child, because she was being arrested for possession of methamphetamine. Correct, Your Honor. And I believe Ms. Gilbank actually conceded that no information was used against her in the criminal context um, regarding the questioning on the methamphetamine. Upholding the district court's dismissal in this case on any grounds this court sees fit uh, is, again, consistent with the court's past precedent, such as in Jensen v. Foley, where this court found that the plaintiff's claims were not barred by the Rooker-Feldman doctrine, but upheld dismissal on issue preclusion. Uh, Also, qualified immunity, such as in Royal v. Payne, where this court noted that most defendants in a child custody case will be entitled to qualified immunity. The defendants in this case are civil servants. Um, They've had this matter hanging over their head for three years now. This is not a case that was dismissed at the pleading stage. Um, Every claim, every defense was fully briefed, argued, and each side had the opportunity to challenge those sufficiently. And we ask that the court uphold the district court's dismissal, uh, both under the Rooker-Feldman doctrine and also the independent claims on their merits. Thank you, Mr. Justin. Mr. Diedrich, would you like some rebuttal time? I would, Your Honor. Okay. Thank you. We'll give you three minutes. Thank you, Your Honor. I want to address two primary issues, starting first with the hypothetical jurisdiction issue. Normally, a district court can rule in the alternative, can give the benefit of the doubt. The one time it can't do that is when subject matter jurisdiction is at issue. The district court here thought it was ruling on the merits of everything else. And that would normally lead to a with prejudice dismissal. But here, if you agree with me that it exercised hypothetical jurisdiction, then what comes up is not a with prejudice judgment, but a void judgment. That is where our cross appeal argument comes from. The other point that I want to address is about the injury. Ms. Gilbank raises a number of constitutional claims in her complaint 
and then talks about different injuries she suffered. Do you agree then, counsel, that if we find that the, that the court did dismiss some claims with prejudice and dismissed some claims without prejudice, then the Jennings, the Supreme Court case, the Jennings case would not bar the court considering qualified immunity, issue preclusion, collateral estoppel, all those issues that were raised in the cross motion for summary judgment? So if there was perhaps a narrow, narrow part of the district court's opinion that was not hypothetically issued, then this court would not be barred by the cross appeal rule. But there is still a, what the Supreme Court has described as a general rule that we don't consider issues not decided below or for other discretionary reasons. And we went through in our brief a number of different reasons why we would request that this court remand instead of deciding issues like issue preclusion and voluntariness for the first time where the district court did not engage in a thorough discussion. Well, let's, if it was remanded, what elements do we have, at least at the summary judgment stage, that there was a section 1985 violation? I apologize, Your Honor. Might I ask you? Section 1985 violation. What facts or allegations do we have to support that claim? The section 1985 conspiracy is supported by the inferences that the social worker and the police officer had discussions prior to actually stopping Ms. Gilbank on the day of the arrest and the seizure of the child. There's a discussion in the complaint about how they colluded beforehand. And that would be part of the conspiracy allegation, which is not barred by the statute of limitations. Colluded or just consulted with each other, as one would normally expect where you've got a child in the custody of a parent who is an active meth user. I see my time is up. May I address that, Your Honor? Yes. So the complaint, the facts are candidly underdeveloped. On remand, it stands to reason that given the request for appellate counsel, that Ms. Gilbank might be able to find counsel below. We would expect to be able to further develop that record and do summary judgment over again. And that's one of the many reasons why we'd ask this court to reverse the subject matter jurisdiction ruling, vacate the remainder of the opinion, and remand for reconsideration of all the issues. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dietrich. And thank you to you and your colleagues and your firm for taking on this appointment in what's a difficult case. You both sides, the briefing was excellent in this case, and you've given us a lot to think about on a very difficult issue. So thank you very much. We'll take the case under advisement. Our next case is Epic Systems Corporation v. Tata Consultancy Services Limited, appeal number 22-2420. Mr. Hockman. May it please the court, Rob Hockman for TCS, Your Honors. There are three fundamental points I'd like to make today. First, I'm going to explain why the prior panel rightly remanded for further proceedings rather than simply ordering entry of a $140 million punitive damages award. Two, that the district court erroneously treated the remand as requiring entry of a $140 million punitives award. And three, why the reduced range that we proposed and we've requested is warranted and indeed even compelling, even compelled here, given what an extraordinary outlier affirming this decision would be. And I'm saving the third point for last because, honestly, we don't think it's seriously disputed here. Epic has not and cannot point to any prior, even remotely comparable case to this one in Wisconsin punitive damages law or national trade secret law history. But let's begin with why the panel remanded for further proceedings. And respectfully, we submit that the rationale of the court's unjust enrichment ruling is essential, really, to understanding its final disposition 
and the scope of the mandate. I'm sorry, did you say eccentric? Ex- uh, <laughs> no, not eccentric. It's, it, it was. It's essential Thank you. to understanding um, the uh, the prior scope, the prior ruling, the rationale, and the scope of the mandate. <clears throat> now, in the first appeal, we argued that as a matter of law, Wisconsin does not allow an unjust enrichment award that is completely unconnected to the actual harm Epic suffered or the actual gain we received. Um, now, we lost that argument. We, we've lost. We're not here disputing that argument. We paid the judgment in full already with interest. That's done. But, and this is critical, we lost that argument only on the law. We did not lose that argument on the facts. And as a, the panel did not deny, and you can read that panel with great read that panel decision with great care, the prior court did not deny that the damages award, the $140 million unjust enrichment award, does not reflect what Epic um, was harmed. And in fact, Epic conceded that it wasn't even an attempt to do that. And neither does it reflect the actual gain we received. In fact, you know, it, it was clear, recall, um, it didn't, uh, it, for our best, let me, let me focus on our benefit because that's really where the action is. There was no evidence that we used Epic's information Mr. to Hoffman, create new software. It sounds like you want to relitigate the merits. Let me ask you a couple of questions here. First of all, do you agree that under Wisconsin punitive damages law, the defendant's ability to pay is a relevant factor? Yes. Do you also agree that the potential damage that might have been done by these wrongful acts is also relevant? The potential damage that might have been done by the wrongful is relevant, but not. I don't think it's an especially strong consideration. And it's certainly, it's very relevant and very clearly the basis of the unjust enrichment award itself. Well, the unjust enrichment was benefit to you all, but uh, I mean, I got to say, the, but, the, the conduct, the conduct that was found here, is the previous panel didn't want us to call it egregious. I'll call it outrageous, uh, uh, scandalous. I don't know why anybody would want to do business with Tata if this is the way they they run their business. Um, and obviously, the jury and the district judge thought pretty uh, serious punitive damages were appropriate. Um, You've attacked the district judge's deference to the district ju- to the jury uh, on the grounds that it was a runaway jury, didn't deserve any deference. Was the jury instructed about any statutory limits? No. no. And was its punitive damage award uh, within the at least single digit ratio the Supreme Court has suggested is uh, um, uh, permissible under the due process clause? Um, it, it, it was it was it was not more than a single digit ratio of the damages award, but mm-hmm. but two things about that. First of all, mm-hmm. they added they actually had a two hundred forty million dollar award, right. which mm-hmm. everybody agreed was erroneous. Uh, the district court and, uh, and and the panel agreed was erroneous. Mm-hmm. And second, um, the Supreme Court has been very careful, and I don't want to relitigate due process. I don't want to relitigate the act the 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 unjust enrichment award either. Mm-hmm. But the Supreme Court has been very clear when damages are large right. as they were yeah. here mm-hmm. um uh the the, the single the, the the nine to one ratio doesn't make any sense and if they're very small warranted. like in the bed bug case correct it can be a correct lot right right okay so you don't want to argue due process what law do you want us to apply here yeah and this 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 law comes from the the, the, the question is when you look at cases like honda motor which refers back to the traditional supervisory role of courts over juries exercising punitive damages awards. And I commend to your, to, to your um, court's review also the Payne decision from the Second Circuit that we cite, where Judge Laval goes into this in, with great care. And the Supreme Court in Gasparini, in Cooper, in Brown and Ferris as well, draws this careful line. It says, it says, well, you know, later on it gets to the due process, but to the due process clause, but it draws this careful line. It says the, a federal court always has the supervisory authority over a jury's punitive damages award. And that's that's essentially codified as the wrong word, but it's essentially in, in ca- captured by Rule 59. And is, it, and is it applying in a case arising under state law? Is yes. Is it applying state law or federal law? That's, so what it, 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 you, can, you can apply state or, you can apply state substantive law. Here, of course, that doesn't matter because there's no meaningful difference between, so the choice of law issue doesn't really matter. But the procedural well, law, the we, procedural sorry, question. Sorry, sorry. I'm okay, going to. But we also have the the panel, as I understand it, saying you waived your Wisconsin or other Wisconsin arguments that weren't already addressed. 
But this is not a Wisconsin argument, right? This is important. Well, that's the question. This is the exercise of supervisory authority by a federal court pursuant to common law tradition as captured by Rule 59 and then subject to ultimate appellate review. And Judge LaValle makes the point. But are we applying state or federal common law? Well, I think it's, in a way, it's both. There's a state, there's a procedural component that has to be federal. Whether it's state, whether when you're exercising that procedural component that has to be federal, I don't think the Supreme Court has been clear on whether there would be state or federal common law. Look at Gasparini, right? That's the closest case addressing this problem. And Gasparini goes out of its way to emphasize the role of the trial judge as opposed to appellate courts, right? Right. And we've got a district judge here who got the case back, looked at it again, did not enter a rote entry with respect, in my view, but went through your arguments, rejected them, and deserves deference. Judge Hamilton, respectfully, I disagree. I don't think it went through the arguments and rejected them. And you can look at A9 of the appendix, and there's a long paragraph there, and it is very clear. He said that the court said expressly it understood its role as only being to consider whether $140 million is still constitutionally infirm. That was the question that the prior panel had already decided. That was not the question that was remanded. And I want to return to why they remanded this, because they understood that the $140 million unjust enrichment award that they had just affirmed at the same time that they turned to punitive damages, they understood that that award included a significant, performed a significant deterrent function. Even Epic conceded that. That's at R926 at 15. And that's because what was awarded was the calculation. Epic received the maximum cost TCS could have avoided if it had, contrary to fact, developed new software in an attempt to compete. Now, that was deemed potential harm that was recoverable. But that is emphatically not disgorgement, because we didn't do it. We don't have software that took the cost of $140 million to develop, and there's no dispute about that. So the overlap, what the panel perceived that's really important here, is that the unjust enrichment award is doing a lot of the work already that punitive damages is doing. And whatever the Constitution says about due process limits on punitive damages, that brings really front and center this traditional role that courts play in policing punitive damages award for rationality and consistency. Can I ask you, where on page A9 of your brief are you referring to? Not the appendix. Yeah, the appendix. I'm looking at A9 here. The district judge went through and did kind of exactly what we asked district judges to, concluding Epic is entitled to a significant award of punitive damages commensurate with the conduct and proportional to the unlawful windfall it almost got away with keeping. I'm looking at the large paragraph in the middle. It's page 7. Yeah, I'm looking at that too. Indeed, all of Tata's remaining arguments for a reduction below the constitutional cap by the Seventh Circuit amount to arguments one might make to a jury, rather to then, should be rather than, to a court only being asked, only being asked to decide on remand whether a twice reduced one or a few is still constitutionally infirm. That's the sentence I'm referring to. And then the next one goes on. Since Tata's arguments are largely unmoored from the constitutional considerations, it criticized us for making arguments that were unmoored from the constitutional considerations when that was exactly what was remanded for it to consider, non-constitutional arguments under this traditional rule. So were you asking it to apply state law or federal law? We cited both, Your Honor, because it's unclear. But we don't think it matters. We think that in either case, the fact, and it's a federal court's job, as a federal court, I think, quite honestly, that this is probably federal, this is probably a federal principle, but I don't think the Supreme Court has clearly answered that question. The federal principle I'm asking this court to apply, and we were asking the district court to apply, is a standard of rationality. Court judgments should not be. That sounds a lot like the substantive part of Gasparini, though, of the material deviation, right? And if you think that's Wisconsin, if you think that has to come from Wisconsin law, we submit it's there, too. It's there, too. But with Wisconsin law, we also have this premise 
uh, as we discussed at the outset, of the relevance of the defendant's wealth as it may affect deterrence and the relevance of potential harm that, uh, of, of such wrongful conduct that needs to be deterred. And, and with respect, Your Honor, mm-hmm. if that potential harm, we're talking about things like potential commercial harm, there'd be some case, somewhere, sometime in the entire history of business tort law where an appellate court has affirmed an award even as a punitive damages award in a business tort only case, even as high as what we've proposed. And Epic has cited none. Never. It's unprecedented, truly unprecedented. And as for our ability to pay, one, once you understand, as the prior panel did, that $140 million for the only use we made is this comparative analysis. We get no software. We have no, we have no functioning item, and there's no dispute about that. There's no evidence of that at all. They looked at all of the code of our software. They had every version we ever made. They found no evidence that we incorporated their information into our products. It's very important. So the deterrent function is significant from this $140 million award. And respectfully, Your Honor, 10 to $25 million for a business tort case, an unprecedented amount of money, that's significant. And I don't think why that's 20, a mere slap on the why, wrist. Why, we didn't 25, why 25 and not 50? Well, um, <laughs> respectfully, we, I mean, what are we doing here, right? Well, well, what we're doing is we're trying to align, and this is again, pain is clear on this. Pain is very good on this. If appellate courts don't impose some measure of rationality and consistency in the exercise of punitive damages, work, inherently subjective, everybody admits that. Whether how how to punish and how to deter, if if appellate courts don't do it, it won't get done. Well, and what do you do, your honor, is ten to twenty-five. You, you, well, we had to find, we had to think of some number that, that would take into account all of the circumstances. Okay. And we chose what we thought was reasonable under the circumstances, even though the numbers we chose were themselves unprecedented. The point is, you affirm $140 million. That's no longer, that's not just a crazy outlier in this case. That's the new yardstick for future business tort cases. That is a big deal. That is potentially disruptive, and Judge Laval's opinion in Payne, and Judge uh, Easterbrook's, and the, this court's opinion in Perez, which talks about freakish awards, that's, that's the definition of this case, Your Honor. So how does that apply, let's say, to antitrust trebling of damages, which is not even discretionary, it's automatic? Why is that similarly freakish, unfair, and violating due process? I think that, I think that in those situations, you're not, you're not in the zone where common law, uh, apologies, Your Honor, sorry, common law courts um, are supervising runaway jury awards, which is a significant problem, historically understood to be a significant problem, and been a historic power of federal courts, as this court recognized in Lust, in Perez, in Sacramento, that the Second Circuit is recognized in pain. I'd like to reserve some time for rebuttal, but if there are further questions, I'm happy to continue. Nope, you can reserve your time. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Brody. Thank you, Judge Kirsch. Uh, Michael Brody for Epic Systems. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, may it please the court. I feel that there's a little bit of a sense of deja vu all over again. The arguments we're hearing today are very similar to what were argued in the first appeal. But I think this appeal turns on the question that I believe Judge Hamilton asked, and that is what law are we being asked to apply here on remand? For TCS has had ample opportunity at every stage of this case to raise every possible argument for why the award is excessive, including every one of the arguments they're raising today. They've had their day in court, they've had close to a decade in court, and they have either already lost those arguments or waived them. And in the decision under review, the district court faithfully applied this court's remand decision, gave TCS every opportunity to raise their arguments, determined that most of them were arguments that were simply being rehashed and rejected the rest. So let me turn to that first point, that all grounds that TCS asserts have been addressed, rejected, or waived. The Wisconsin statute and the constitutional limit are behind us, but I think the claim has to either rest on Wisconsin common law or federal common law, and neither is available to TCS. First, on Wisconsin common law. 
TCS raised the argument they're raising today about the excessive punitive damage claim, the claim that the damages were excessive and beyond what was necessary and an outlier under Wisconsin law, in a post-trial motion filed in 2016. It was denied by the district judge in 2017. They made exactly the same argument in their second post-trial motion, denied again, this time in 2019. But TCS ignores what happens next. They did not appeal that determination. When this matter came before the court the last time, TCS raised four arguments, and the court outlined those four arguments in its opinion and disposed of every one of them. The argument that this was an outlier under Wisconsin law and exceeded the power of the district court to affirm was not raised. And this court concluded then what this court should conclude now. The court said at page 1145 of its opinion that TCS only mentions Wisconsin law to point out that Wisconsin courts apply a test substantively identical to the federal test analyzed above, that being the due process test. So the court concluded TCS has waived any argument that Wisconsin law might produce a different result. That was in the very last paragraph of the court's opinion before the word conclusion, after the, the paragraph began in sum. So there are two consequences to draw from that. One is that TCS can't raise an argument, abandon it on appeal, and then assert it in a second appeal. That's just waiver. But we're here interpreting what, the, what this court meant when it issued its prior opinion. And it's unreasonable to interpret this court's prior opinion to instruct the district court to go back in time, revive a waived argument, and consider it anew in a remand where the remand order contains no such language. And the district court correctly perceived that, stating at page A5 of the appendix that TCS was just rehashing old arguments. What about federal common law? Well, I think Erie answers this question. The last time we were here, TCS argued that only state law applied. They conceded there was no applicable federal law. And this court said as much. And that, of course, is compelled by Erie. Now, there is a role for federal courts to play in reviewing punitive damage awards, just like federal courts have that role in reviewing every award. That role comes from Rule 50 and Rule 59, which the district court applied in deciding the post-trial motions. TCS makes much out of the Cooper case. In Cooper, the Supreme Court held that you have a de novo standard of review for the constitutional standard. Got it. But then it went on to say, what about the other issues? And the court had the following language, which is on point. The court said, a good many states have enacted statutes that place limits on the permissible size of punitive damage awards. Wisconsin does. When juries make awards within those limits, the role of the trial judge is to determine whether the jury's verdict is within the confines set by state law and to determine, with reference to federal standards under Rule 59, whether a new trial or remitted or should be ordered. That was the prior post-trial motion. Judge Conley denied it twice, and that was not appealed. The court went on and said, if no constitutional issue is raised, the role of the appellate court, at least in the federal system, is merely to review the trial court's determination under an abuse of discretion standard. So yeah, there is a federal review of jury verdicts, Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 50 and 59 permitted, but that's been satisfied here. The next point I'd like to make is, well, what do we make of the court's remand instructions? And the court at the beginning, this court at the beginning of its discussion of punitive damages, advised litigants and future courts to address constitutional issues first, excuse me, constitutional issues second, after resolving the non-constitutional issues. And TCS takes some comfort from that language. That's just the principle of constitutional avoidance, that courts should look for ways to resolve cases without reaching the constitutional arguments. And TCS relies on those cases, but they turn them on their head. TCS would interpret this court's prior opinion as saying, the Constitution limits damages to $140 million. Now, district court, go back and see if there's a reason to lower it below that. In other words, district court, go back and make a decision that moots the constitutional analysis we just engaged in. That's not how this court operates. In Sacramento, that's not what the court ordered. In Perez, the court did not reach the constitutional issue. It sent it back to decide the non-constitutional issues first. In Beard, 
the court said exactly the same thing. This court said the court is only to address the constitutional issues if the other issues uh, lead to a higher punitive damage uh, judgment. And uh, I contend in Epic, it's the same. Um, this court's prior opinion was not an advisory opinion to go back and see if there's a reason why the district court can moot the decision of uh, this court. Um, I don't know, as a district judge, I got a few remands that said, in essence, we'd like you to think about this some more. <laughs> Without well, Your Honor, if, if there was a non-constitutional issue uh, remaining, that's what this court would have done the last time. It would have said, uh, there's a non-constitutional issue raising, uh, remaining that you haven't addressed sufficiently. Go back and think about it some more. Uh, and then we'll decide whether to reach the constitutional issue. In, in the Beard case, it's a great case, the, the district court applied a five to one ratio. This court said, we're not even gonna look at that five to one ratio because there's some antecedent issues you have to decide first, go back and decide them. Um, but that's not what the panel of this court did uh, two years ago. Um, what if I'm wrong? What if these issues remain live? They've not been waived or decided. Did the district court abuse some discretion, which is the standard that Cooper tells us? Uh, the answer is no. Procedurally, uh, the district court gave Epic, excuse me, gave TCS every opportunity to raise every argument, uh, and it addressed them on the merits. But did the district court improperly defer to the jury verdict? No, I don't think so, Your Honor. I think that the district court applied both in 2016 and in 2017 when given the post-trial motion. And again, uh, the district court went back and looked at the facts as it did, and that decision is not an abuse of discretion, as Cooper would apply. Uh, TCS makes much of the fact that this award is unprecedented, and I'll speak to the facts uh, in a moment, but it, it's really not. Um, the Exxon Valdez case, obviously very different facts, 500 million in punitive damages. The Sintel case, it's a district court case we cited in our briefs. Um, it was decided after uh, the prior decision in this court in Epic. Uh, it came up under the Defend Trade Secrets Act case, and excuse me, Defend Trade Secrets Act. And that statute authorizes juries to award damages, like Wisconsin law, under an avoided cost theory, and that's what the jury did. It awarded $285 million in compensatory damages on an avoided cost theory, just like here. It avoided, awarded two to one punitive damages, uh, applying the two to one statutory cap in that statute, just like here. It came up to the district court on post-trial motions, and the district court applied this court's decision in Epic One. It didn't do it as a matter of constitutional law, it did it as a matter of common law, and uh, followed it and reduced the punitive damages to one to one, upholding punitive damages of 285 million, uh, twice what we have here. Uh, so there are prior cases, but, but those cases are interesting because Sintel and Exxon Valdez are cases in which federal courts applying federal common law look to the Gore factors to inform the decision about what an excessive award is. In both those cases, that's exactly what the court did. And the realization that federal common law or this review of punitive damages under federal common law merges with the Gore factors really supports affirmance here because this court has already made that determination. Um, I have well, one more point uh, that I'd like to make with the court's indulgence, and that is, um, and, and Mr. Hockman has referred to this, and maybe it's the elephant in the room, and the, the damages here are large. $140 million is a lot of money. Uh, as I pointed out, it's uh, a large trade secret award, not the largest. Um, Sintel uh, was twice as big. There was a Virginia um, trial court determination last summer in a case called Appian. It hasn't been reviewed yet for $2 billion. So the, the numbers are out there. And as Judge Hamilton pointed out in antitrust cases all the time, uh, exemplary awards that dwarf this are upheld. But, but that's not my point. My point isn't that this award should be affirmed because there are other awards like it. My point is the award should be affirmed because it should be large, because the conduct and uh, TCS uh, merit to this kind of award. There is no mathematical rule that courts should apply. Courts should consider all the facts and circumstances of the case. And here we are, years removed from the trial, years removed from the facts. It's easy to forget why we're here. 
But the punitive damages here reflect a record of intentional, repeated theft, organized and sanctioned from the highest levels of TCS, from their headquarters uh, in India and seemingly free from detection. TCS hired someone for the express purpose of infiltrating Epic's trade secrets. He shared his credentials with unknown number of people. They copied and viewed and downloaded hundreds of thousands of pages of documents, and they did it to infiltrate the portion that made Epic software, which is used in most hospitals across this country, valuable. And when they were caught on it, they engaged in a practice in, in their words, to suppress the truth. Despite being a global technology leader, they failed to preserve documents, they allowed documents to be overwritten, were criticized for not knowing the extent of the theft and who used it. Well, there's a reason for that, because documents were lost, and that's why the trial judge awarded an adverse inference instruction. So the award is large because of what TCS did. It's also large because of who TCS is. $140 million is a lot of money, I, I cannot deny that. It's 4% of what TCS earned in the year this case went to trial. That was $3.5 billion. Wisconsin law allows the consideration of wealth. Um, their income in one year was, uh, this was only 4% of one year's income. Since trial, they've earned profits approaching $23 billion. So $140 million, absolutely a lot of money. But it's appropriate here. now. It may sound like I'm making a jury argument, and I'm trying not to. I'm just reminding the court that the assessment of punitive damage is not just an academic exercise. It's a judgment of the conduct and the defendant, and the award is large because it should be. We know that because the jury told us that. We know that because Judge Conley told us that in denying the first post-trial motion, the second post-trial motion, and in upholding the award on remand. And we know that because this court so ruled in applying the Gore factors and finding that 140 million did not offend the due process standard when judged on reprehensibility and the conduct at issue. So yes, 140 million is a lot of money, but it shouldn't be any lower. And if TCS has a complaint, it is not with the district court, it's with its own conduct. Thank you. Mr. Ackman, we'll give you two minutes. Thank you for your indulgence, Your Honor. I'll, I'll try and be brief. Um, recall, in the prior appeal, the parties sought rehearing. After the rehearing, the prior panel went out of its way to add the discussion of Sacramento and Perez, to add a reference to the power of a court to review freakish awards. It had already said in its disposition the remand should be for consideration of, at most, $140 million. You have heard today no explanation for that remand. And as for why we think there was an abuse of discretion, it's because what the Seventh Circuit asked for has never happened. It asked for a consideration of these non-constitutional issues in light of its opinion, in light of the analysis of this decision. That could not have come before. And as for forfeiture, this was fully briefed because of the remand to the district court. They had every opportunity to make all their arguments. The district court had every opportunity to rule on it. And as I've detailed, and as A9, as that ultimate paragraph of showing the analysis reveals, the district court just didn't do it. And we're asking for this court to provide the relief that this court said is necessary in light of the fact that unlike any other case, and there are other cases out there. There's certainly other trade secret cases out there with large damages awards. But the rationale of this decision is a large unjust enrichment award that is not disgorgement. It is not give, putting, restoring the parties to their prior position and then punitive damages on top. It is a massive award with significant deterrent effect and then on top an additional punitive damages award. Allowing that kind of yardstick, allowing that kind of ruling, freakish ruling, unprecedented ruling to stand, would create a whole new world that, in fact, the court's review that the court ordered anticipates against, that Payne advises against, and that Justice Breyer, in a separate opinion in Gore, 
emphasized that treating like cases alike, ensuring some degree of rationality in the system is the essence of law. For those reasons, we respectfully request that your honors um, vacate the judgment and, ent and an order entry of a reduced punitive damages. Thank you, Mr. Hockman. The case will be taken under advisement. Our next case is GG versus Salesforce, case number 22-2621. Hold on for one second, Mr. Warren, and we'll wait for counsel to be ready. Okay, Mr. Warren, whenever you're ready. May it please the court. My name is Warren Harris, and I represent the appellant in GG. Okay. The Supreme Court heard argument yesterday in Gonzalez versus Google on the scope and interpretation of Section 230C1. Because the Supreme Court's decision in that case will almost certainly affect the threshold question, I would like to focus my argument today on FOSTA. Congress and FOSTA added Section 230E5A to preserve Section 1595 claims arising out of sex trafficking. That is the claim at issue here. This court should reverse the dismissal of plaintiff's section 1595 claim and remand to give plaintiff the opportunity to prove her claim on the merits. Congress explicitly amended section 230 and FOSTA to preserve section 1595 claims arising out of sex trafficking. The relevant language added by FOSTA appears in section 230E5A and states that nothing in this section shall be construed to impair or limit any claim in a civil action brought under section 1595 if the conduct underlying the claim constitutes a violation of section 1591. Mr. Harris, isn't, isn't that the problem that you have in this case? I, I ask this is, let's for, forget 230 and forget the FOSTA amendment altogether, okay? If you, get to, if you get to 1595, you have to allege that Salesforce knew or should have known that the venture violated 1591. Right? You yes. agree with me? But in order to allege that Salesforce knew or should have known that the venture violated 1591, you have to allege that Salesforce knew that Backpage violated the elements of 1591, not just 1591 in the abstract. So you have to be able to allege that Salesforce knew that Gigi was under the age of 18 and was sex trafficked. And, and to me, that's, that's the problem that you have. I mean, it, it's, it's a, it, from the standpoint of, like, we look at this accomplice liability, okay, under 18 U.S.C. Section 2, in order to prove accomplice liability in, say, a, a 922 gun case, you have to establish that the accomplice knew that the defendant, the person who possessed the firearm, was prohibited. In other words, that they violated the elements of 922G. And here, why is that not the same? Why do you not have to allege that Salesforce violated the elements of, or Salesforce knew or should have known that Backpage violated the specific elements of 1591? Because of the language of Section 1595, Your Honor, this, this is not a criminal case. It's not. Okay, tell me exactly what language. I'll look at, look, let me look at the statute here. Exactly what language? An individual who's a victim of a violation of this chapter may bring a civil action against the perpetrator, here's the relevant part for a beneficiary liability claim, or whoever knowingly benefits financially or by receiving anything of value for participation in a venture which that person knew or should have known engaged in an act in violation of this chapter. I don't believe there is anything in that provision that requires, in, in the civil context, in beneficiary liability, anything that requires the civil defendant to know of the specific victim that was trafficked. But doesn't, doesn't the language that person knew or should have known has engaged in an act of violation of that chapter? In other words, the way I read that is Salesforce 
knew or should have known, okay, that either Salesforce or Backpage or the venture, that doesn't matter. Right. Salesforce knew or should have known that the venture, let's say, has engaged in an act in violation of this chapter. The only act in violation of this chapter is 1591. Well, I agree with that, I think. Right, Mr. Harris? I mean, 1591 Correct. is the only. So in order to know that someone has engaged in an act in violation of this chapter, why do they not then know that they have to have violated the elements of the chapter or of 1591A? Because this is a civil claim which doesn't require that level of knowledge. If, if it were a 1591 violation, of course it would But be. it says it right there. I mean, it says knew or should have known. And to, to me, that means what it says. Knew or should have known means knew or should have known. Now, you can argue should have known a little easier than known, but I don't know how you can allege the violation of 1591 under either the knew or should have known because I don't think you have any allegation that, that, that Salesforce even should have known of Gigi or that she was under the age of 18 or that she was sex trafficked. You're right, Your Honor. There's been no discovery taken in this case, and we don't have any. There's nothing in the complaint that Salesforce itself knew of GG specifically. That's correct. But in paragraph 86 of the amended complaint, it states that Salesforce knew or should have known that many of the persons posted for sale on Backpage, including plaintiff, were forced into sex trafficking and or were minors. That's paragraph 86. And so the allegation that Salesforce made is that Salesforce had constructive knowledge of the venture. That's why it was analogous in the argument to ML. Yeah, yes, Your Honor. Salesforce, we, we believe Salesforce did have knowledge of the venture. The sex trafficking venture is what Salesforce was engaged in with Backpage. And it's the venture that violates 1591. And we believe that's all that we have to prove is the venture is violating Section 1591 without a requirement that um, the, the beneficiary know of the specific person traffic. I mean, but it, it has to have constructive knowledge. And so, in, in essence, what you're arguing is that because of the venture itself, the constructive knowledge of the venture, that Backpage was engaging in trafficking of minors, it was inevitable that Gigi, a plaintiff, including, would have been, in essence, inevitably trapped in or could have uh, become a part of this trafficking venture. Y yes, Your Honor. So well, it's the constructive knowledge. Y yes, Your Honor. And, and if, if you applied it where there had to be a actual knowledge of the specific victim, if that were the standard under 1595 for beneficiary liability, it would be the rare case indeed that anyone would ever prove liability under the statute. No doubt. Do we, do we expect that kind of specificity, for example, in holding a bank liable for money laundering? It doesn't have to know about the specific drug transactions, does it? I, I don't believe it does, Your the, Honor. Let me, let me ask you, Mr. Harris, this is a very unusual statutory provision. You know, yeah. I, I've never seen it before. Um, but we, uh, my, Judge Kirsch was referring to, for example, accomplice liability under 18 U.S.C. Section 2. Um, as I was looking at this, I'm thinking also of the material support for terrorism um, standard. And, and basically, we seem to be, to me, I, I want to throw this out for comment, in essence, somewhere in between there. Um, uh, participating in a venture is a little more demanding. I'm not sure how much more, but more demanding than providing material support for ISIS or, or Al Qaeda or something, and but it's something well short of accomplice liability, where you know about the elements and intend for that to, to succeed. Yeah. Yes, Your Honor, I, I agree. And let me let me ask you what troubles me most about your side of, of the case, and that in essence is the line drawing problems. Um, both with respect, and, and, and the defense has brought this up. Um, and this comes into play, for example, with the material support for, for terrorism co comparison or, um, you know, what do we do with a company that sells computer servers to, um, to uh, uh, Backpage? What do we do with a restaurant that caters the monthly b business meeting at their headquarters? What do we do with um, their banks or their landlords? In this case, is so far over the line, there is no need for the court to engage in line drawing here 
because the participation is so extreme here that Backpage provided tools and software. It had meetings. I understand your point, but we have to draw lines and would at least, if we were to reverse, would at least have to give some hints about where those lines might lie for future cases so that lawyers can advise their clients. And, and we believe that it, that it is this participation standard, which is not defined in the statute. In 1591, there is a participation that's, that's defined for a criminal violation, but the courts have generally held that that standard should not be imported into the civil, uh, into the civil standard under 1595. So it's the standard of participation that the court has to look at. And again, in this case, with the knowledge, it's undisputed that Salesforce knew that, or certainly it's well alleged in the complaint that Salesforce knew or at least should have known of the sex trafficking business of Backpage. Backpage was a sex trafficker. That's yeah, I don't think I don't think that's your problem in the complaint. I don't think 1595 is the problem in your complaint. I think the problem that you have is the specificity of 1591A. That's very, very specific. Congress was very specific. And in order to violate 1591A, the allegation must include a particular person. And so that's where I think you have the biggest problem is once you get to 1591A, you can't allege that. And you admit that you can't allege that. We just have to ignore that element or, or say that you don't have to allege it. Which And then how do we draw the line? Does the girlfriend have to know that her boyfriend is prohibited? Does the getaway driver and the bank robbery have to know that they're where you know the getaway driver can participate in a bank robbery? There's no question about that. Without knowing that a bank robbery was going on, right? What what do we do about that? Well, a, a couple of points there, Your Honor. Again, civil standard, not a criminal standard, and we believe that makes a difference. Plus, but what? How, how does that make a difference when the mens rea is new or should have known? Like, what difference does it make whether there's you know, it's it's not reckless. It's not it's it is not a negligent standard. It's new or should have known. So, what difference does it make that this is a civil context rather than a criminal context, other than the burden of proof? Un, under the language of 1595, looking at the language of the statute, engaged in a violation of the chapter. So, it's engaged in a violation of 1591. All that is required is knowledge that you know new new or should have known that the venture was trafficking, was engaging in a violation of the statute. And how does the venture violate 1591? The venture violates 1591 by engaging in criminal sex trafficking as defined in 1591. Against a person. Against a person. And again, it's new or should have known that it was engaging in sex trafficking. There is nothing in 1595 that requires you go back and tie it to a specific person or this specific But 1591 does say that. In order for you to establish that, it has to be against a person. And Backpage and the traffickers, the perpetrators, were engaged in sex trafficking against a person. They were doing, they, they engaged in sex trafficking against hundreds or probably thousands of persons. So that's a violation of the statute. That's all that's required to be shown. There is no requirement that we have to go and say. Does it's, Salesforce then have to have constructive knowledge of that? Salesforce has to ha has to know or should have known of the trafficking, and we believe that is properly alleged here in the complaint. And that's that's a negligent standard, right? Mm -hmm. It's constructive knowledge. Yes, it, it's okay. constructive knowledge. It's unusual in criminal law, but I would like to reserve my some time for rebuttal, if I may, please. Yes, Thank of course. Uh, I'm Mr. sorry. Can I ask one follow up? Sure. Should we hold this case until the Supreme Court decides, Gonzalez? I, I believe you should, Your Honor. Um, it's not clear from the argument exactly what the court might do, but it is expected by many to be a landmark 230 decision. And um, if the court doesn't hold, it may well be that we're back, back here or back somewhere soon uh, trying to reassess the 230 issue in light of Gonzalez. So I think that would be prudent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Ms. Lindsley. May it please the court, Kristen Lindsley on behalf of Salesforce. Plaintiffs seek to hold Salesforce liable for alleged misconduct by Backpage, a company that through an affiliate 
subscribe to Salesforce's cloud-based customer relationship management software that is used by over 150,000 businesses, governments, and other entities. Cloud-based means that instead of information being stored on local servers, local uh, computers, it's stored on Salesforce's internet-based servers. It can be accessed by employees of the customer, that is, the software customer, uh, through the internet. Ms. Lindsay, can we jump to just Section 230? Is how is Salesforce being, I guess, covered under 230? Mm -hmm. is, it, is it the contention that Salesforce is being held out as a publisher? Well, there's two elements, Your Honor, that mm -hmm. I think are embedded in your question. I'll start with the publisher part. Yeah. Um, uh, Salesforce, um, Salesforce is an interactive computer service, and I'll get to that in a moment because that's a definitional issue. Uh, so that's one element. And then are the plaintiff's claims tr treating Salesforce as a speaker or publisher mm -hmm. of somebody else's content? And that's uh, the way the, the statute says information provided by another content information content provider. So the district court here found that yes, Salesforce was being held, was being treated as a publisher by plaintiff's claim for two separate reasons. One, Gigi's harm, the only harm to Gigi that relates in any way to Backpage or to Salesforce in this case, are the ads that were posted by third parties on the classified ad website that Backpage offered. So those ads are third-party content that are posted by another information content provider, the traffickers. And plaintiff's claim is seeking to recover for harm to GG, and that harm flows directly and exclusively, at least from the standpoint of this case. Obviously, there were other actors involved, but the people in this case, the harm that's being attributed to Salesforce flows exclusively from the, that third-party content, the ads. Secondly and separately, uh, the district court correctly held that um, that Salesforce was also being held liable liable for Backpage's own content. That is to say, customer data that Backpage allegedly gathered. But Gigi says, no, 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 no. What we're holding Salesforce to is agreeing to join into a continuous business relationship with an entity or an enterprise that they knew it was engaged in sex trafficking. Right, but you still have to understand how that supposedly came about. The only, con the, so just, if I could be clear, it's, it's significant, I think, to look at what is not alleged in this case, because this is very important. Plaintiffs don't allege that Salesforce had anything to do with any of the ads that were posted for Gigi or anyone else. Salesforce had nothing to do with the website that Backpage operated, nothing. Salesforce had no involvement whatsoever in Backpage's content policies, by which it allegedly sanitized these illegal ads to hide the fact that they were ads for sex with minors. Nor do they, and in fact, if you look at paragraph 112 of the complaint, it itemizes all the things Backpage did wrong, mm -hmm. including trafficking Gigi by accepting ads for her, receiving money um, on behalf of those ads, for those ads from the traffickers, and engaging in this content sanitization process. Can we process. just direct as to what Salesforce did? So that, that might so, help move us along a little bit. So quicker. if you if you so my point is only that there's no allegation that any of that activity involved Salesforce or its software. Um, so Salesforce is accused of helping Backpage with marketing activities. So what were the marketing activities? It was providing a database that allowed Backpage to put its customer contacts up on a secure, confidential, cloud-based database, and then to collect that information and post it up to the internet, and then to use that posted information to develop and send marketing email campaigns to its customers, okay? That's what they allege Salesforce helped with those activities. But what, what, what they allege is they, Salesforce helped to do that by providing the software that allowed Backpage to do those activities. So Backpage was posting its own content up to the internet, onto the, onto the um, cloud-based system, and using that posted content to send marketing emails via Salesforce's Enterprise Edition CRM um, software. So that is the third-party content for which, under this, the district court's second theory, 
Salesforce is being held liable for Backpage's posting of its own content, that's third-party content. It wasn't generated by Salesforce, and they don't claim that it was. Um, and then, likewise, marketing activities, marketing materials posted through How did the Salesforce. district judge then not use a but-for causation? But-for, but-for, Backpage posting this information, Salesforce would not be liable. How do we distinguish that? from what you're arguing here is that the marketing activity is what Salesforce engaged in, but still should be deemed a publisher. No, we're not saying Salesforce should be deemed a publisher. We're saying plaintiff's claims treat Salesforce as a speaker of that information. Speaker. In other words, they're holding Salesforce liable for the adverse effects of all of this marketing activity. Now, we allege, we claim, and, and I will argue when we get to 5095, that none of that establishes a trafficking claim. It just doesn't. It doesn't even come can, close. Can, can we decide the case on 1591 yes. and not deal with 230 yes. at all here? And, and, and in fact, I'm happy to address that next, if that would help, because I think the answer to Your Honor's last question is, um, the court doesn't really need to wait for Gonzalez because the court can resolve this case I, on, under 1595 for failure to state a claim. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but uh, could I ask you about the, your 230 theory? Yeah. Um, would seem to let back Page off the hook as well. No, it wouldn't at all, Your Honor, because um, in the Doe versus back Page case, the First Circuit found that the allegations there did not state a 5095 claim against um back page because it was barred by section 230. It was that case among others that led Congress to take up the whole FOSTA okay, amendment. Okay, so sorry, let me, let, me, be, let me sharpen my question. Yes. Your theory about being deemed a speaker or publisher would seem to reach back page a la the First Circuit's decision in Doe mm -hmm. before FOSTA. Right, so let me answer that too. I think that one of the anomalies of, of the First Circuit's decision in back page that, that was discussed to some extent in the legislative materials in FOSTA um, is footnote four. If you see in footnote four of Doe versus Backpage, the First Circuit decision, the court specifically says we are not addressing an argument that was raised only by the amici, but it's, it was a correct argument. And people have commented on why Doe's lawyers didn't raise the argument. And it is that Backpage, by sanitizing the ads, editing the ads to remove words that would have flagged that this was an underage person and letting the ads run anyway uh, was itself um, creating the illegality of the conduct, the content that yeah. made it not third party content anymore. It was back pages, illegal content that was sanitized to allow this illegal mm -hmm. activity. So that's the first answer. And then obviously FOSTA mm -hmm. is the second answer. Mm -hmm. They would not be. Right. Okay. Turning to 1595, could you explain to us where your theory and the Ninth Circuit's um, in the Reddit case, what what effect your theory gives to the phrase in 1595, or whoever knowingly benefits financially or by receiving anything of value from participation in a venture which that person knew or should have known is engaged in an act in violation of this chapter. So that seems to be adding potential defendants who are not perpetrators of 1591. What, what, what effect do you give that provision? Um, if I could, let me start with, I'll start with 1595, but I do think the two, the two statutes are in some ways parallel. Both of them allow liability, criminal and civil, against the perpetrator first, and both of them allow participant and eventual liability against a participant and eventual, criminal and civil. So in many ways, 1595 mirrors the structure of 1591 and as well as other provisions of that chapter. There's a sort of the perpetrator and then there's the participant liability. But um, I also wanna, I, I think that J Judge Kirsch had it exactly right, that you can't have, that the whole knew or should have known that the venture violated 1591 requires knowledge that the activities that occurred um, that are being challenged actually violated the elements of 1591, and that includes the specific knowledge element relating to the person who was trafficked, that person's specific circumstances, including force, or that they're underage, and also including that they were going to be engaged, uh, caused to engage in commercial sex. So you have 
you have a direct correlation between the violation by the venture and the violation of 1591. And if that weren't enough, I think if you look at the, if you go back to the beginning of 1595, it says um, the, the, um, it says that there's a remedy to a victim of a violation of this chapter. So the words violation of this chapter are what create the remedy for the victim. And we think that further confirms the idea that the violation of this chapter committed by the venture has to be the same one that the, the victim is a victim of. In other words, 1595 itself confirms that the violation of the chapter that relates to the victim it must be the same violation that the venture committed. Otherwise, the statute makes no sense. Because under but isn't another, it possible though to know that someone committed a crime without knowing all of the details of how they committed the crime? Constructive knowledge. I think the constructive knowledge is better understood. Do do you know you knew or should have known that the person was being caused to engage in commercial sex? Did you know that for a fact? Maybe not, but you should have known because if you saw that person's circumstances, it would have been obvious that they were under duress, they were being mistreated. They were under 18. Any of those things would have absolutely furthered the should have known from the circumstances what you were seeing going on with this victim. And this comes up in the hotel cases all the time because you have these hotel, the, the, the cases, um, you know, um, Riccio, um, um, the Riccio case, McLean, I think it's called McLean versus Riccio from the First Circuit, was a hotel owner. Mm -hmm. And that hotel owner knew or should have known that this person was being trafficked because he, he had worked with the, with the um, trafficker before. They he high-fived high -five the, the trafficker lot. in the parking lot. Uh, and it was obvious that they were high-fiving and saying, let's get this thing going again because they had done it before. And he saw her there in the parking lot being dragged by the trafficker into the hotel and she was pleading for help and he ignored it. That's the kind of should have known. Did he know she was being trafficked? And the court even went so far as to say that they never consummated the trafficking in the sense of him offering her to anyone else. But but the hotel owner should have known that she was being trafficked. And, and, and that, that was case, the holding of Riccio. In that case, the difference between that case and this case is in that case, I think the plaintiff could allege in the complaint facts that the defendant should have known that the elements of 1591 were Correct. violated or satisfied. Correct, and that's Here, exactly what the first Gigi circuit. can't get, can't take that last step, mm -hmm. and I think the, the issue is that the specificity of 1591, not 1595, 1591. Right. I would have thought the problem, though, here is, in essence, we're not attacking, um, we're not trying to deal with, with one hotel owner and one plaintiff. We're talking about... Um, a, a, at least a national scale enterprise. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that takes you, I think, most quickly to the Red Roof Inn case, which is the 11th Circuit case that deals with an analogous situation, but one involving franchisors, not the hotel owner, but the franchisor who was providing policies to the hotel owners, overseeing their activities, training their employees, etc. So in the Red Roof Inn case... The but in that case, don't they stop at step two and don't get to the last question as to as to the does? In that case, they they find there was no participation in a venture relating right. to the does. Right. So they do acknowledge the... In fact, they state outright the requirement that there needs to be knowledge and participation by the franchisors in a venture that involves the does. Right, as to the does is as the critical the thing there. Yes. As, as, as to Gigi as is to, the critical thing. Here. Exactly. As to the does, they had to show that. And and the courts that they didn't show that because they didn't show any kind of participation um, in any venture that involved them. The, the hotels knew there was a trafficking problem in the industry. They had looked at online reviews of some of the hotels, even the, the locations in question, and had seen reports of people saying there's illegal activity, there's prostitution, and there's trafficking at these hotels. They had seen that, and the 11th Circuit said that's not enough um, to show participation in this venture involving these does and this trafficking. So that was the 11th Circuit decision. And um, if I could just touch briefly, oh, I'm out of time. <laughs> Any other questions? Just a moment. Um... 
Hey, let me let me just throw out an impression and invite your comment. Uh, I don't know if I could, Ms. Lindsley. Um, your the FOST argument. I I have trouble understanding the so-called plain language argument um, that you made and the uh, that the Ninth Circuit adopted in the Reddit case. But um, the the argument seems to assume that civil and criminal liability have to be congruent for every actor here. That's between 1591 and 1595. No? No, Your Honor, because 1591, oh, um, 1591 comes into play only when the defendant otherwise would be protected by Section 230. So in the wide swath of cases involving hotels and other actors who aren't subject to Section 230, 1595 is completely unchanged. The only time it comes into play is as an exception to Section 230. So you're presupposing an interactive computer service provider. I am presupposing 230 for purposes right. of this argument. Yeah. But, um, but for, for regardless of the product or service being provided, mm -hmm. um, the and I go back to my original question to you about what meaning you give the knowing benefit. It is possible to knowingly benefit financially um, from participating in a venture which that person knew or should have known is engaged in an act in violation of this chapter without committing a violation of 1591, correct? Correct. Being criminally the, liable. Correct, except to the extent that, that 1591A1 a two provides for venture liability. So well, it provides so, for beneficiary criminal liability. Correct? correct. On actual knowledge, as opposed to constructive correct. knowledge. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. So we can split, but we can split between civil and criminal liability for these for this participant liability. Correct. Right. Okay. And I guess so. In such a case, um, it sounds to me like then. The participant would have would be civilly liable under 1595 without being able to prove they are criminally liable under 1591 with actual knowledge. Correct? Except for FOSTA. Under FOSTA, that's changed. Congress specifically made it the law that if you're suing an interactive computer service provider who otherwise would be protected by Section 230, you must show criminal intent. You must show a violation of the criminal statute. That's exactly the word. Well, that you have the to show that says. somebody violated. Well, here, let me just. That's the question, through. right? May I answer yes, the question? Yes, of course. Um, so, starting with the statutory text, FOSTA exempts any claim in a civil action if the conduct underlying the claim constitutes a violation of 1591. Now, somebody, somebody has to violate. For several reasons, I think that somebody is the civil defendant. And there's many textual clues, I think, that point in that direction. One is the any claim in the civil action obviously relates to conduct underlying the claim. Now, if all Congress had meant to say is that somebody has to violate 1591, so it's a predicate to this exemption, why would they have said the conduct underlying the claim constitutes a violation? That is setting up a standard of proof that the plaintiff has to meet in the civil case against somebody. And it wouldn't make any sense for the plaintiff to have the burden to show that the conduct underlying the unrelated activity that gave rise to the claim that's not at issue in the case constitutes a violation of Section 1591. If, if, if but, your theory is correct, it would have been much simpler to write 5A to say any claim in a civil action brought under fifth Section 1595 of Title 18 against a party who violated Section 1591 of this title. But you still have to, the Congress still has to set up that it's going to be adjudicated in the civil action. If you, if, you went, if you said it that way, that sounds like somebody might read that as requiring that person to have been previously convicted that's, of that's a violation. That's an old RICO argument that's been disregarded for decades, right? I mean, that, but I mean, he, but he, you just but have here, to prove the violation. The, Congress could have done it that way, but I think the way they did it is clear. The conduct underlying the civil claim yeah. constitutes a violation of 1591, but if there was any doubt about it, if you look at the provision, as we argued in our brief, that, um, it, it, first of all, you look at the two criminal exemptions that immediately follow the one we cite. The, those are state law criminal charges 
if the conduct underlying the charge violates 5091 mm -hmm. or in the next one violates 2421A, which are the federal criminal mm -hmm. statutes. So as multiple courts, including the Ninth Circuit and Reddit, have pointed out, th the construction of those three exemptions is identical. You don't and think that allows for, in essence, vicarious criminal liability there? Uh, in essence, associate, either aid or a better associate, conspirator, etc.? It's just saying that if the conduct underlying the charge against the state criminal defendant mm -hmm. must constitute a violation of the federal um, okay. trafficking mm -hmm. laws. And then just third is, is we would point to the legislative history where Congress initially in the original bill had a provision that said any claim under 1595 would be exempted. That raised alarm bells, um, mm -hmm. among others, with the industry that and, uh, and internet experts that said that that would subject the entire internet to a negligent standard to make sure that content that people were putting up didn't relate to sex trafficking. So it would sort of undo Section 230, not just as the particular topic, but for every topic, because you'd have to engage in monitoring of all content. And 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 that was what so it was after. So we'll be replacing the word the with any. Underlying the claim with underlying any claim. Under well, what the, what the Congress did was actually it, it added the words mm -hmm. if the conduct underlying the claim. That's what I'm asking. Yes, yeah. violated section or constituted a violation of section 5091. So that that change occurred right after these hearings, where all these witnesses were testifying. So it's in, in the in the floor statements even though I don't usually like to cite them, are pretty clear as to why that happened. It was because of the, that particular concern. If there's no other questions, and with your thanks for letting me go over. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lindsay. Okay, Mr. Mr. Harris, we'll give you your five, five minutes. Thank you. Yeah, please, the court. Judge Hamilton, let me start out and <clears throat> address two points you just raised. One is wouldn't it have been much simpler for Congress to write a different way? That's exactly right. In fact, Congress did that in Section 1595D. Uh, that's the Parents Patria Statute that oh, Congress oh. authorized state attorneys general to bring a civil action against, quote, any person who violates Section 1591. Real easy. That's the way Congress did it there. But in 230E5, instead of requiring that the defendant violate Section 1591, Congress required an underlying violation of Section 1591. Those different words mean different things. That would be a very convoluted way to say something very simple that Congress said simply elsewhere. And Judge Hamilton, also to your question about is it possible to violate 1595 without violating Section 1591, the answer is absolutely. Um, the civil defendant in 1591 does not have to, to have met all the elements and have a criminal violation of 1591. That's the purpose of 1595. It's a remedial statute. It should be applied broadly. And, and I understand, Judge, your questions about, well, but don't you have to look at the person and know, have specific... Yeah, but don't, don't you, you can't just say, should have known of a violation of 1591 in the abstract. 1591 means something, and it says something. So get rid of the title 1591. I think you have to allege should have known that. Now, what does 1591 say? Should have known that the person was under 18 and sex trafficked. That's what the statute says. You, you, I don't, I, maybe you can react to this. I don't know. How do you say this, we're just going to take 1591 in the abstract and boil it all down and what it means is sex trafficking? And there is a requirement that there is a new or should have known standard of a violation of 1591. I agree with you, Judge. Where I think 1595 should be read differently is there is no requirement in 1595 that the civil plaintiff know that the person trafficked by the venture I'm with you is, there. Is, the, is the plaintiff standing there, that there is a requirement. You have to know that the venture engaged in sex trafficking of a person with the requirements of 1591 it may be one person it may be 50. no no people. no it has to be the person that that's the problem you i i don't think you can just take 1591 which says the person and then say 1591 or 1595 changes 1591 from the person to a person 
You, you see, that's the trouble I have. You see, a violation of this chapter, a violation of 1591, a violation of what? What does 1591 say? 1591 says the person. And that's where the law is very, very narrow once we get down to 1591. And, and I think we have to just look at the language of 1595 and what Congress intended from that language. And I, I don't believe there's any indication that Congress intended it to be that specific plaintiff. That's just a matter of statutory interpretation of 1595. What particular injury did Salesforce cause to GG? Uh, what was the first part of that, John? Particularized injury did Salesforce cause? Salesforce engaged in a venture that that engaged in sex trafficking. Salesforce participated in a venture that engaged in sex trafficking. The venture trafficked GG, which caused all of the injuries that were caused to her as a result of the sex trafficking, the mental anguish, et cetera, the physical harm. It was all, all of those that the venture is responsible for. And what evidence do we have or any factual allegations that Salesforce provided personalized technology? I know we say that word a lot yes. in the complaint, but what, what evidence do we have of that? Paragraph 45, they talked to the customer. Paragraph 33, specific customers had unique needs. Paragraph 48, back page, um, consulted with the sales force to assess the operational needs. I mean, th those are a few, they're set out all in our brief, but those are a few specific um, chapters about specific needs. Also, paragraphs 44 to 46, I think I've given you most of those. But those specific chapters, I believe, have that allegation. Hey, thank you, Mr. Harris. Th thank you, Your Honor. This court should reverse and remand for further proceedings so that this case may be tried on the merits. Thank, hey, thank you very you. much. Thank you, counsel. The case will be taken under advisement. Our next case is the United States versus Jamar Jarvis, appeal number 22-1146. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, may it please the court, counsel. Mark Rosen appears on behalf of the defendant, Jamar Jarvis. I think this is a case, it's pretty clear it's plain, a plain error situation here because the Rule 29 motion that counsel filed did not involve the specific arguments that we have, but I think it's pretty clear that these should have been there. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty obvious that the instrumentality that was the witness identified as being put in her face during this armed robbery at the middle, 11.30 at night in a dark alley surrounded by garbage cans, which you can't even see on the video, materially different than the one that was later recovered in the backpack. I think she, you know, she was a detective of 27 years or can't remember how many years, and she specifically said that it had an extended clip. Um, and the one that we found later on was found in the backpack did not have the extended clip. Uh, it's different. It's clips just not, can be changed, right? Hmm. Pardon me? Right? Clips can be changed, right? Certainly, but they didn't find the other clip. They're, I mean, they still have the burden of proof. Uh, there still has to be reasonable inferences there. There's no indication as to why they would change the clip or anything of that nature. The fact of the matter is they were relying upon what they found in the backpack being the gun that they found with the clip. The clip was there and it was a smaller clip than the extended clip that was found. I don't know why they would go about and change the clip to put a, even in a smaller clip in there later on down the road, it just wasn't the same implementation. It wasn't the same apparatus. There was the no use of a fake gun raised? Pardon below? me, Your Honor? The use of a fake gun argument, was that raised below? No, it wasn't. That's so we also, agree that plain error would apply? It's plain error, is, this is a plain error case, totally a plain error case. Um, and I think also we have the issue with the, uh, the issue is of the fake gun. I think that that's there before the court. The, the, Defendant, I mean, the government has never rebutted that that's, these sorts of toys exist out there in the internet and in the world. I think these companies out there, such as the one I had cited in my brief, uh, provide these things for the specific purpose of making young people think that they're really cool with slides that are metal, which is the whole basis that this w victim said, I know that that was a real gun because it had a slide that was metal. But that's what she said. That's exactly what how, she said. How is the government, how would the government ever prove a real gun in a situation like this unless they apprehended Mr. Jarvis with the gun in his hand and she said, that is the gun that he was holding in my face 15 seconds ago. This is an interesting jury argument, okay, that the government didn't prove it's a real gun. 
But from plain error review, you're asking the judge to sit there and listen to the jury trial, and you're asking the judge. The defendant doesn't make this argument. The judge is just supposed to pull it out and say, well, wait a minute, it's obvious to me that this was not a real gun, despite the victim's testimony, who happened to be a Chicago police officer. It's, Boy, it's, that's, that's a lot to ask. It, it is a lot. But the thing is, is, and that's where the thing comes in with her becoming a Chicago police officer, saying, you know, you can say, if I see, and somebody's thinking, oh, it looks like you have an extended gun, hey, you know, what do I know? I'm just, I'm but, just, for, I just give you an observation as, as defense lawyer and as prosecutor, I was always a bit surprised that when someone had a gun pointed in their face, that they were able to identify the color of their gun. Okay, let alone the make of the gun, the magazine. So I, I, I always expected there would be some error in the description of the gun. And you're thinking, all right, is my head going to get blown off here? Not how am I going to identify this gun later when this guy is prosecuted? That, that's fine, except she volunteered that it had an extended clip. She was a detective of 27 years. And, and there, there was no, th- and there was no discussion of that, right, at trial? Was About... No- about the extended clip. There was no attempt to argue that that disproved um, the case. And that's, I would think that's the kind of thing that, if it's a big deal, uh, I would expect the defense to do something with it and let the government and the witness respond as best they could. That we don't be, have any of that here. No, we don't. And that's why it's a, it's a plain error argument. I mean, I think I discussed this with my client as to whether or not he wanted to go habeas with this in an effective assistant counsel. He said, no, go forward with what you've got because I like what you've got. Because I clear clear the thing that if this was a state court, I would have gone in effective assistance of counsel in state court and said this should have been argued. But my client said, that's why we're having a plain error argument here to do it. Because I I think it does meet the plain error standard. So do do you believe the air pistol description would, that we're bringing here would have been more appropriate under a collateral attack? And maybe a 2255 petition? Possible. Well, that's what would, my clients, we discussed that. And my client said, you know, go with what you've got with the, the plain oh, error argument, because I like your arguments that you've got before you. It's not necessarily you. an either or. But, no. Well, but, that's uh, what. But, but what do you do, um, for example, with the Carter case, and it cites the McGee case, where we've got discrepancies in the description of uh, the relevant firearm. And we repeatedly have just said, look, that, that's a jury question. That's fine, but it was never brought out to the jury as this being an issue. This was, uh, I, this was the situation where you've got the detective, and they, once again, the government said, you know, believe this detective. They, they cleared it, this is a long-term detective. She came in and she said it has this facility on it. It has this feature on it. There was no, they could have, if they had brought her back in and they could have easily done that, she was around and said, after they recovered the firearm, said, is this the firearm that Mr. Jarvis stuck in your face? And she said, yes. Then, then we wouldn't be here. But didn't we have didn't, here testimony that, that the gun was trial? real? Pardon me? Didn't that happen in no, trial? No, it did not. All they did was put, the victim came on and then then she, they left. Then they talked about finding the, the backpack, and that's all they did. They, cool. Nobody, she never came back on, from my recollection yeah. of the trial. So she's not able to say, that's the gun, right? She couldn't, she wouldn't expect that, right? I don't know. I don't know, but it was never presented. I mean, that, that would have been, okay. you know, if she would have either said yes or no. But the fact of the matter is, it didn't happen. But so the no. jury did hear testimony from the victim that Mr. Jarvis pointed a gun in my face. What she perceived to be a gun, yes. And Foster there was also, here. I'm sorry, look, no, you wasn't there also a follow-up with testimony from that victim that she believed the gun was real? Yes. And so there was a jury credibility determination made. And she, and she said she believed the gun was real because she identified it by the slide. She said, when I saw that slide, I knew the gun was real, which Mr. leads to the whole issue about these fake guns. Mr. Rosen, there's more to that. Someone said, I'm going to blow your head off. And then the police identify the vehicle. They chase down the defendant. He's carrying the backpack. They recover a real gun. I mean, this probably wasn't a real close case, is my guess. Well, I I understand all those. Those are the uh, three of the four elements I'm not disputing. It's just the second, because this goes to the second element, which is whether or not my client had the intent to cause a death or great bodily harm. And I think, as the Jones case said, 
which is uh, <coughs> pretty clear uh, that uh, if you've got somebody uses an unloaded firearm, it becomes a relevant issue as whether or not there was the intent to cause death or great bodily harm. That's where this whole bollock, this whole situation comes in. Don't the in facts it. of this case get around that? Because the allegations were that Jarvis, um, while pointing a gun in her face, fanned around her with four other individuals imposing a, a serious threat that if you didn't comply with the with the request or with the demand that she would be injured she would be i think the issue was whether or not she would be shot it was basically do you want to die tonight while well, he's point with the, the person to the left said that it but wasn't there's my three other individuals not standing do you want there to, not do you want to how does it feel to know you're going to die tonight right? correct and i think they were referring to the gun because they didn't, once she gave the keys up, they didn't do anything. They didn't fire at her. She just, they, she ran away and they, they left and they took the gun. So that wasn't clearly something that was done. I think everything, all that was referring to the, to this alleged gun <coughs> that was in front of her face, which as I've indicated, uh, they, it's not what was recovered. And it's just. So I, I, I got to ask you, Mr. Rosen, about this, on the theory for including this internet ad in your appendix. Um, you were correct that we have required contents for the appendix. Correct. But uh, I have never seen a claim of a right to include material that is not in the district court record before. And, and I, I was arguing that because I had put that in there. As I put in my reply brief, <clears throat> I don't know what would have happened if I had put it in. It's not something that would require discussion by the district court. The government has never asserted that these sorts of toys don't exist. It's, I think the court can take judicial notice that it does exist. I've seen opinions by this court where they refer to uh, authoritative sources that are not part of the record in terms of supporting. I discouraged that, but. <laughs> I, I understand. <laughs> I, I, I'm just saying from my observation. Would rule okay. fair, fair enough, fair yeah. enough. So would, I, would rule 10E not allow this, though? Pardon me? Rule 10E. I, I don't remember what rule 10E was. Right. Supplementing the record on appeal. Oh, um, I don't know. I, I didn't go that route, Your Honor. I did go with the Rule 2080 with the... It was the argument brought up by the government that Rule 10E blocks the court. Okay, I, I apologize. I'm out of time. I, I was... were, so were you trial counsel or was someone else? Somebody else was, Your Honor. Okay, because I, I looked in your brief and you were the only firm you identified as having represented Mr. Jarvis. Oh, I'm sorry. No, he had a different firm for trial. I'm the only firm that represented him for, representing him for appeal. Okay, thank you. I apologize for anything. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Rosen. Okay, Mr. Tucker. Good morning, Your Honors. Brad Tucker for the United States. Um, this court should affirm Mr. Jarvis's convictions. First, there was sufficient evidence that he brandished a real as opposed to a fake gun. Um, plain error review applies here, so for Mr. Jarvis to prevail, the record must be devoid of any evidence that the gun was real, and he must show that a manifest miscarriage of justice would result. That is not the case here. Um, as the court was pointing out, the victim of this carjacking testified that the gun she saw pointed at her from close range, uh, just a few feet away, was real. Do you think she was offering an expert opinion, Detective Iser? <laughs> no, Your Honor. She was. I think she was drawing on her, her own experience. Mm -hmm. um, and she was testifying to something she actually saw happen. It, it's not as though she was being shown a weapon that she didn't see for herself. It was it was based on uh, the events she perceived herself, not mm -hmm. not a gun um, that was shown to her. Maybe you know, assume she's not involved in this and, and sees it later. In which case, mm -hmm. I would agree it's probably expert testimony. But a layman, a layman, for example, who's uh, a non police officer who's familiar with a lot of firearms in their own lives might be able to offer a similar bit of testimony. Yes, sir. Say, it seemed real to me. Right? Okay. Yeah. Um, the defendant has pointed out, the, you know, potentially some inconsistencies in in her description of the gun. Um, even if that were the case, and I, and I do think the victim sort of equivocated, and, and she said it had like an extended clip, and then she goes on to say it was just a gun. Regardless of whether or not she she was off on a detail, um, she she said it was a real gun, and, and as the court pointed out, there's many cases that say. A witness doesn't have to get it exactly right, and, and the, it's a jury credibility thing for, for the you know the jury to determine whether or not they think she got it right, and they clearly thought she got it right and that it was a real gun. Um, 
Beyond the victim's testimony, there was other evidence that the gun was real. Um, as the district court itself pointed out, um, on video shortly after the robbery, Mr. Jarvis was seen carrying a pretty distinctive tan backpack. And then you fast forward another 20, 30 minutes, and that backpack is found to have a loaded gun with a round chambered in it. Um, he also, uh, defendant also made comments on a recorded jail call, admitting that he had a gun that night. All of that evidence in the record shows he used a real and not a fake gun. Um, I want to quickly address defendant's argument that if the gun was fake, the government necessarily fell short of showing he had intent to cause death or serious bodily injury as required by the carjacking statute. That, that just you know, simply misstates the law. There's no requirement in that statute anymore that you have to use a gun. Turning to defendant's second argument, um, there was also sufficient evidence that defendant acted with the required intent to cause death or serious bodily harm. Um, as I said, the evidence showed he used a real gun. He pointed at the victim during the carjacking. From that, the jury was entitled to conclude that he had the required intent. Um, apart from the gun, there was also a statement made by one of the other carjackers um, that the court has already pointed out. That statement was to the effect of, how does it feel to know you're going to die tonight? And while that statement was made, Mr. Jarvis continued to hold a gun at the victim's head um, before and after. Um, his, participa his participation in that way showed that he had the same intent um, as communicated by that comment. So that's another basis on which you know, the, the court can affirm that he had the required intent. Um, unless there's any other questions, uh, for these reasons, uh, the government has asked, asked this court to affirm. Thank you, Mr. Tucker. Mr. Rosen, would you like some rebuttal? Okay, we'll give you two minutes. Thank you. I looked at the Carter case, Your Honor. I, I was looking it up in my reply read. That was materially different from this. From what I recall with reading that case is that there was testimony outside of just the victim. There was a co-conspirator co co who basically testified about the placement of the gun and how they recovered the gun in a van. So I don't think that that's just, it's the same. Uh, she based her expertise based upon the slide. That's what it was. And that's what her total basis was. She said unequivocally, I knew it was a real gun based upon the slide. And I know we get, I didn't look up Rule 10E, Your Honor, but I know that uh, basically it was just, it's my, my exhibits 21, A21, A23 were just sort of examples of something that you can just find on the internet that these companies are out there trying to sell it. It's just basically common sense and common knowledge. Uh, you can simply look it up. Um, in the jail call that they relied upon, he never, you know, contrary to what Mr. Tucker says, he never admitted that he had a gun or anything of that nature. He never admitted he had a firearm. He never, it was never asked, it was never referred to. I think his father just simply said, do you have it or did you have it? It was not recorded whether or not he had the backpack or what it was and his father basically said, I don't read his mind, I don't know what he was talking about. And that's what it came out. So did the father suggest that the it, he believed he was refer referencing the gun? I believe he, he did, but then on cross-examination, I think he said that it's not, you know, I don't know what's going on in his head. I don't know what's, you know, like he could be talking about different things. I, I don't know. Uh, as far as the death or serious bodily harm, as Mr. Tucker points out, um, it's not required it was a gun, but that's clearly what the context was, was this is my client's putting this implement in front of him, this fellow to the left, not my client, says, at that point in time, says, do you want to, are you ready to die or tonight, or words to that effect. So it's all in the context of the gun. It's not in the context that we're going to beat you up unless we get these, these things. Um, the other carjacker was the one, the fund to the left was the one who made the statement, not my client, and there were no shots. So there, that, there are no further questions, Your Honor, I'm done. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rosen. We'll take the case under advisement. Thank you. Our next case is Michelle Baptist versus the Commissioner of Social Security, appeal number 22-2281. Mr. Rector. Thank you, Your Honors. And uh, may it please the court, my name is Matt Richter uh, on behalf of Plaintiff Appellant Michelle Baptist. The ALJ committed reversible error in this case by granting great weight to and wholly adopting the stale residual functional capacity assessed by the agency's reviewing physicians who completed their assessments years before new objective imaging which demonstrated significant new ideology 
an appellant's uh, cervical spine in a complicated uh, surgery as well to, to address brain aneurysm. Uh, Mr. Richter, um, does the plaintiff contend that depression was a severe impairment here? I'm sorry, Your Honor, could you repeat that? Does the plaintiff contend that her depression at, at various times was a severe impairment here? Uh, yes, Your Honor, I believe her depression was a severe impairment, but I'm not sure it's... Um, I didn't see that as part of the... I'm not, sure, I'm not sure it's relevant to the, uh, okay. to the arguments. That I don't think made. it is. Does she contend that her aneurysms are a severe impairment for her after the surgery? Yes. How so? Um, she had complication after the surgery. Right. There was the visit to the emergency room a few weeks after the surgery, right? Right. How about beyond that? Uh, well, do we, do we I, have doctors uh, finding restrictions on her functional capacity um, attributable to the aneurysms? Uh, I don't believe it's related specific, specifically to the aneurysms, um, but when you have, um, again, not, not a doctor here, but when you have uh, a neurological issue like an aneurysm as well as cervical spine uh, problems, it's hard to really pinpoint where the 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 well, that's what we're asking the ALJ through. to do, correct? Say that again. I'm that's sorry. That's what we asked the ALJ to do, correct? Y yes. And so I'm trying to understand the extent to which your case depends upon evidence related to the aneurysms, or whether we need to just focus in closely on the cervical spine issues. I think the most significant uh, cause, and the most significant issue, is certainly the cervical spine imaging. Okay. And in particular, the imaging done in uh, the spring of 2018. That's right? correct, Your Honor. So point us to the doctor's response to that imaging that you think shows the ALJ made an error here. I've so, looked at those doctor's reports, Ellison, Amin, and Graham, and I see conservative treatment, don't basically don't do anything different. Um, so I, I think what really, um, the thing that, that demonstrates that this is a significant etiology is the, the sorry, compromise. Etiology, is that the word you're using? Etiology, I'm sorry. Yes, that's okay. correct. E-T as opposed to I-D-E-O? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I, I think uh, the underlying basis of the impairments um, that, you, that you, can, you can see demonstrated on the 2018 MRI is the compromise of the cervical spine itself, the ventral aspect of the cervical spine. And the doctor's interpretation of the MRI um, then, then diagnosing radiculopathy, which is, um, you know, by definition, uh, you know, there's an, indi it's an indication that there is some compression of the spine or a nerve root some, somewhere. Um, and there is abutment, is right? Yes, abutment. Okay, not compression. And where do we see the doctor, the doctor saying, in essence, this explains her situation, or this um, imposes restrictions that effectively render her disabled? Well, that explicitly is not there, Your Honor. And I think that speaks to um, the point of the case. That's why we need um, an expert to but look. But didn't an expert look at it on May 8th, the neurosurgeon, Dr. Amen? Um, there's, they, they've characterized the degree of degenerative disc disease. They're not speaking to medical corroboration of the alleged limitations um, caused by the, the contact to the cervical spine. Um, so you're agreeing that they, Dr. Amon, the neurosurgeon, mm -hmm. her neuro, treating neurosurgeon reviewed the MRI? Yes. And the neurosurgeon did not find any additional, did a full examination, reviewed it? Didn't opine upon physical limitations. And that's, that's not distinct from any of the case law that's cited here. There's, um, you know, in Gowen's, Goins, we don't have an opinion from a doctor that says um, the, the cervical spine compression is causing her, her to not be able to lift and carry something. That's the problem with this line, with, with these cases, is that no doctor is giving an opinion as far as medical corroboration of the allegations of physical limitations made by 
the Social Security claimant. Um, so when, when, you, when you look at a case uh, like Goins, um, you have uh, a new finding and you don't necessarily have the doctor who interprets the MRI and puts it in a report saying, well, these are the physical limitations that would, would reasonably result. Um, but here you do have a neurosurgeon, her neurosurgeon, that reviews the MRIs and says, we're going to continue conservative treatment. Okay, yes. Um, but I, I, I don't think there's a standard um, as far as, as, as what the doctor thinks about the significance of the MRI, the, of the MRI based upon whether um, we, we shouldn't have a standard where the doctor has to say, well, you need surgery or there's no worsening of the, of the etiology demonstrated in the MRI. Um, just continuing with conservative treatment isn't necessarily an indicator that there hasn't been a worsening um, to the spine. Does it matter here, Mr. Richter, that does it matter that the um, claimant has the burden of proof? Uh, Your Honor, and, and I'll, I'll cite to a, a, a previous decision made by this court, uh, it is a non-presidential disposition. Non-presidential disposition. Not very helpful. Well, Your Honor, I, I would could I you, would let could, you know that could you, you were, address could you address the burden of proof. The 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 burden of proof on the plaintiff is to produce evidence, not necessarily medical opinions, and that's a direct quote from the from the Kemplin case, citing the Scott case, which is a presidential case. And in Your Honor, you actually were on the the. Uh, the panel that uh, that uh, issued that decision, Kemplin. Um, and Kemplin was the non-presidential case you're referring to. Yes, but it does cite to okay. to Scott. And can you what Scott? Uh, that that quote in Kemplin, I believe, is uh, what it what was taken from Scott. And that and that quote is again. Can you give that to us again? Um, that the. Uh, Claimant's burden is to produce evidence, not necessarily opinions. Mr. Rector, would you like to save the rest of your time for yes, rebuttal? Yes, I would, okay. Your Honor. Thank you. Mr. Budd? May it please the Court, Stephen Buddy on behalf of the Acting Commissioner. Um, the ALJ recently weighed the evidence in this case. She acknowledged that Ms. Baptist had a severe cervical impairment and accommodated with her with significant work restrictions. However, Ms. Baptist's own doctors consistently interpret the imaging studies in this case as showing only mild or minor findings, and they consistently recommend only conservative treatment. Ms. Baptist's initial x-rays, cervical spine MRI, and EMG showed findings that multiple doctors interpreted as mild or minor. Doctors recommended only conservative treatment with medication and Ms. Baptist declined recommendations for steroid injections. On this record, the state agency reviewed and concluded that Baptist retained residual functional capacity for light work. The record after the state agency review remains consistent with the record prior to their review. Uh, while Ms. Baptist had another EMG in 2017 and a cervical MRI in 2018, the doctors who administered these tests interpreted them as continuing to show only mild abnormalities. Baptist was then referred to two specialists, a neurosurgeon, Dr. Amen, and a physiatrist, Dr. Graham. Dr. Amen interpreted the EMG and MRI as showing only mild findings with no severe spinal narrowing. Dr. Graham found that the studies showed only minimal spinal narrowing with no red flag signs. Both doctors continued to recommend only continued conservative treatment with the same medications, and Ms. Baptist continued to decline recommendations for injections. Put simply, it was Ms. Baptist's own doctors, not the ALJ, who interpreted these imaging studies. The ALJ properly relied on Dr. Ms. Baptist's doctor's statements. She also correctly noted that Ms. Baptist's doctors continued to recommend only medication and injections, and Ms. Baptist continued to decline injections. With similar facts, this court recently held in Durham that an ALJ is allowed to rely on the assessments of the claimant's own doctors regarding medical studies especially when there is no significant change in treatment following those studies. Similarly, in Ducharme, the court has recognized that an ALJ does not need another medical opinion 
if the ALJ relies on the interpretations of the claimant's own doctors. The assessments of neurosurgeon Amen and physiologist Graham support the ALJ's findings about these updated imaging studies, and the ALJ is not obligated to seek another opinion. Well, what do we do with the plaintiff's argument, though, that, that in essence they weren't trying to address functional capacity and impairments? Well, for, for starters, it is the ALJ's job to assess functional capacity, and this court has held that an ALJ is... Yeah, 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 but, but they have to do it on the basis of, of, of evidence, and uh, there, there seems to be a step missing here. Well, the ALJ relied on the state agency reviews, uh, reviewers um, who opined that she could perform... Yeah, that was years earlier, though, right? But the, I think the salient point is that the record before their review and the record at the review are essentially identical. In the terms doctors, of the in terms of the spinal imagery, in terms of the doctor's interpretation of those images before the review, the doctors have EMGs and MRIs, and they interpret bottom line interpret those studies as showing mild findings. After the state agency review, the doctors uh, have another EMG, another MRI, and they arrive at the same conclusion. Um, so the the record before the state agency review and after the state agency review is uh, similar with respect to how Ms. Baptist doctors uh, assess these studies and um, treat her impairments conservatively with only medication. Can I ask a quick question? Um, why doesn't uh, Ms. Wangard count as a treating source here? Ms. Wangard is uh, a nurse practitioner and under agency policy um, at the time of the decision, nurse practitioners are not acceptable medical sources and only acceptable medical sources can qualify. But today Shady. they would be? Today she would be, but today the regulations have changed and the agency no longer has a treating source role. Mm -hmm. um, so right, right. We no longer okay. give special deference. Um, and so let me, let me just ask you, what does it mean to say the ALJ played doctor other than that the commissioner loses <laughs> when, the, when the court applies that label? What does it look like? Well, I think there's a distinction between cases such as Durham and Ducharme where an ALJ relies on the claimant's physician's interpretations of the imaging studies versus a case like in Goins where the uh, imaging study revealed the whole new impairment. Uh, it revealed uh, a possible source of the claimant's complaints of headaches. Um, in McHenry, um, the ALJ compared the MRI findings herself to the earlier MRI findings. The ALJ didn't do that here. He just uh, relied on the claimant's doctor's assessments, which were con remained consistent throughout the period. Um, and uh, in Aiken, um, the third case, plaintiff cites, um, the state agent, agency doctors didn't review imaging studies at all. There were no MRIs before them. Um, so uh, DLJ concluded that updated studies uh, continued to show mild findings, but there was no support for that conclusion in that case. I mean, I, I think it's a case-by-case -case inquiry but uh, the salient point, too, is that um, this court has recognized repeatedly that it's uh, within the ALJ's discretion whether an updated medical opinion is necessary. Um, and uh, Can Ms. we Baptist talk just for a minute about Atkin versus Berry Hill? Okay. Yes. And in that case, the ALJ erred in discrediting the plaintiff for receiving what deemed conservative treatment or conservative course of treatment. And the ALJ here considers the conservative course of treatment a key factor in assessing the severity of Ms. Baptist's conditions. How is this case, I guess, distinguishable from Atkin? Well, in this case, the claimant's own doctor subscribed for treatment as conservative. Um, her only treatment is medication. Um, she declined injection treatments. Her doctors, after the new imaging studies, recommend continued conservative treatment. Um, and the ALJ properly is relying on their assessments for treatment. Um, this court has recognized ALJs can consider conservative treatment. Uh, this court has held that medication and injections is conservative treatment. ALJs are allowed to consider that. Um, I think an ache in the era was that the ALJ uh, was assessing the significance of imaging studies um, that were not reviewed by doctors. Um, but in this case, uh, the ALJ is relying on the doctor's assessments of those studies. Um, regarding aneurysms, uh, briefly, uh, the ALJ didn't just rely on the state agency. The ALJ considered the evidence, um, including the claimant's January 26th surgery and her hospitalization shortly after that surgery. But the ALJ noted 
Um, only six weeks after surgery, back to his own doctors, released her for full activities with no restrictions. And the AHL still credited a 20 pound lifting restriction that her pre-surgery doctor recommended as a precautionary measure. Um, regarding the opinions, um, Dr. Allison admitted that his opinion simply recounted uh, Ms. Baptist's subjective complaints. Uh, he suggested that uh, she might be malingering because she exaggerated her uh, uh, made inconsistent effort during strength, grip, and range of motion testing. Um, Wasn't that just a couple of months before the brain surgery? I believe so. But uh, this was what uh, Dr. Allison said was the basis for his opinion was simply Ms. Baptist's own complaints. Um, and this court has held uh, in the Brit decision that an ALJ may reject the doctor's opinion entirely when it's only based on the claimant's subjective complaints. Um, I, I understand the point, but when that patient needs surgery, brain surgery two months later, I'm not sure that rationale extends that far. So. Well, I, th I think the record in this case shows that Ms. Baptist's initial neurologist, I think it's Dr. Siddiqui, um, recommended just monitoring her aneurysms with uh, uh, not doing any surgery at the moment. Subsequently, she had uh, an updated uh, a second opinion, I, I guess, from Dr. Amen, and he offered her the option of surgery, which uh, she uh, decided to go with around November 2015, as I think when, he, when she saw him for the first time. Um, and Dr. Amen is actually the same doctor who interprets uh, the imaging studies later. Um, but the record shows um, that Baptist aneurysms, uh, within six weeks of surgery, she was cleared to return to full activities. Um, there's no subsequent evidence of any uh, complications or surgeries or uh, further treatment besides uh, annual um, exams. So I think the record uh, supports the ALJ's conclusion that this is a non-severe impairment and there's really no contrary evidence that this limited her after, until after, uh, shortly after surgery. Um, just uh, to conclude, the Supreme Court has observed that the substantial evidence bar is not high. Uh, the commissioner respectfully submits that the decision meets that bar here. Um, and if there are no further questions, the commissioner asks that the court affirm the decision. Thank you, Mr. Buddy. Mr. Rector. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, just briefly, um, as it relates to uh, conservative treatment and abut abutment of the ventral cervical cord. Um, I want to make the point here that what Ms. Baptist needed to prove was not that she was bed bound or even close to that. Um, because of her age, all she needed to prove was that she couldn't be on her feet for six hours a day and she couldn't you know, lift and carry up to 20 pounds for just over two and a half hours per day. Um, so when we're talking about abutment of the spinal cord and things like conservative treatment, um, I don't believe that those, those things or, or the conservative treatment would speak to whether um, there's, there's medical corroboration <laughs> for the difference between the ability to stand and walk for six hours and the ability to stand and walk for only five. Um, I, I think, uh, and, and I think the reason um, the court has been so consistent in the past about um, saying, why not let a doctor look at this, is because it takes expertise to determine whether abutment of the spinal cord medically corroborates um, uh, a, a, an inability Rickard, to. Under to, your test, wouldn't every time a plaintiff or claimant went to a new doctor and got a new report we'd have to I mean we, this process would never end it you're right would never end you're, under you're, your test you're correct that is but that is not my test um, my test is because uh, here the ALJ looks at the reports and she says this is what they say and basically this is kind of easy I, I don't I'm not interpreting anything right. I'm just reading the results from the MRI and there's no difference here there's no material difference that's it I, I have a hard time accepting the notion that um, an MRI that doesn't show a, a disc contacting the spinal cord and then a subsequent MRI that does show a disc, you know, at least touching the spinal cord um, are, not, are, are not two medically uh, different, different items. And we're having this debate here over it, but 
but uh, none of us are, are really qualified to answer that question in my view. Um, and you know, what, 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 what the court has concluded in the past is that um, where it's potentially outcome determinative, uh, where the new evidence is potentially outcome determinative, um, a doctor should look at it. And in this case, there's no question that the new MRI could reasonably be interpreted to keep uh, appellant from standing and walking six hours of eight hours every single day. Uh, so I, I just think that uh, on that basis, reversal and remand is, is required Could I quick, here. quickly ask sure. you, if I may, just, um, you, did you adjust your claimed onset date here? I, I didn't represent uh, Ms. Baptist at, uh, at hearing. What and are I, you asserting as the onset date here? Um, it, well, it, until you would go back before Social Security, it would remain what it, what it was. But she could be found, her onset date could be found any time between the alleged onset date and her date last insured, which is the end of last year. So uh, well, what, know, I'm, what I'm getting at is if we were to agree that somebody needs to look, that a doctor needs to look at the new MRI, mm -hmm. that would not go back anywhere near the time that she applied for benefits. No, it would likely, it would likely go back at the earliest to the the new cervical spine MRI, in my in my opinion, as a as a social security practitioner. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Your Honors. Okay, thank you, Counsel. The case will be taken under advisement. And our last case of the day uh, is Sarah Thomas versus Nina Joint School District, Appeal Number 22-2527. Mr. Henderson, can you hear us? I can. Thank you, Your Honors. And uh, thank you for allowing me to appear remotely at short notice due to the COVID issues. It's it's very appreciated, uh, perhaps by others in the courtroom as well. Um, <laughs> if it please the court, we're here really to present a rather straightforward question. And that is ultimately when reviewing the decision of a district court, particularly a dispositive one on a motion to dismiss, do we want it done fast or do we want it done right? Now, I am painfully aware that I am presenting that statement um, when it's five minutes after noon, the last argument of the morning, and my client's request for relief is the only thing standing between all of us and lunch. Uh, but we I long ago learned to breakfast well. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, Your Honor. And, and perhaps that brings me into a a good first point, and that's the notion of I could fixate on lunch, um, but fixation becomes the problem. Really, the, the key issue here in the case from our point of view is a fixation that the district court has with proving the existence of a widespread practice or policy strictly by repetition. In this case, we do not disagree with the case law that defense has quoted, that the court quotes indicating that when repetition is the issue, you've got to show more than once or twice. Absolutely. You have to show certain things that aren't necessarily there in this case. The question becomes, do we ever actually have to make that inquiry? Our position is that we should not in this case, because that's not how we prove the existence of the practice or custom, or rather at this point, I should say, that's not how we raise a plausible argument of the existence of this particular custom or practice. Instead, what our amended complaint presents is a situation in which really there are three key elements to our claim of why we believe there is a practice and custom at work behind the actions of a couple of the teachers and police officers working with defendants here. And the first is, I'm going to present it in slightly different order in the brief, than the brief, and my apologies, but I'll present the first one today as a specific reference that the school district later makes to these actions of Mr. Fridley and others on the day with the child in question, and that they refer to it in subsequent communications with the mother, my client, as a support. And in the context of their ongoing communications having to do with special education, a support is a specific term of art. A support can mean all kinds of things out in the general world, but in that particular world, it has a special meaning. Um, and that special meaning is essentially a chosen and deliberate response to behavior, a means of responding to a student's disability, for instance. 
and a means that's ultimately essentially policy. It's, in fact, directed, it's practiced, and that's the very point of it. And so the first issue there is that we effectively have the existence admitted through that. We know that there is a support. That, that seems to me, Mr. Henderson, somewhat circular. Um, we, for example, uh, let, let's suppose we're dealing with a police action shooting, and there's always going to be an internal investigation of that. Um, and the police come back and they say, uh, what the, the, the police officer here acted consistent with departmental policy, didn't do anything wrong. Um, there's a ra radical factual disagreement about what in fact happened. But uh, is, is that finding, that the, the, the internal finding that the officer, or in this case the teacher, didn't do anything wrong, uh, sufficient to permit a, a, a Monell claim to go forward on a practice or custom? Judge, I, I'm not sure if it would be alone or not in the police context. I think in, in this context, it's a little different. And, and what you point out is similar to the second element of how we show our claim. But that element doesn't exist in a vacuum. And one of the things that I would define a little bit differently here in terms of what's happening in this case is the complaint that Ms. Thomas raised to which the school district responded, I, I would say similarly to what your honor just suggested, the idea that we didn't find anything wrong with this, that what they're talking about isn't simply a random contact between a police officer and a person that potentially turns deadly or tragic, but rather an exercise of specific authority, specific practiced protocol to do the support, to respond in a certain way oh. to what's happening here. And my apologies, Judge, it looked like you were about to ask a follow-up. I didn't want to interrupt you. If, if not, I'll, I'll move on. I did want to ask you where in your appendix is the judgment in this case? Mm. It should be in the required appendix with the brief, Your Honor, if I remember correctly. You gave us the fact, opinion. I, I know I it is. I was just looking at it. You gave us the opinion, but not the judgment. And particularly... Oh, I, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Mm. It can be I don't a problem. Know if there was it, a separate... it appears to have been harmless here because there's no question about this having actually been an appealable final judgment. But with motions to dismiss, it often can be. Um, yeah, I apologize if, if I made an oversight there, Your Honor. And, Your Honor, I would say one more thing to the issue of what is part of this appeal that I think is is relevant here. I, I don't want to sort of pre-argue defense's case, but I do think it's important to address something that is a significant feature of the defense's response brief here, and that is to bring other issues into the appeal, such as causation or whether or not there, the force used was excessive. The reason those are not part of this appeal is because no findings or judgment was issued, no opinion was issued adverse to us from the district court. Um, you know, we're not here to appeal the motion to dismiss from defendants, but rather the order based on it from the district court. Well, which the defense gives... is entitled to offer an alternative basis for affirming, such as there was no underlying violation here. And when you don't file, you're not required, contrary to what the defense says, you're not required to argue that in your opening brief, but there was no reply addressing that. And that's a concern. And you're in, again, on Your Honor, I respectfully would, would disagree. I understand, of course, the position of the court there. And well, what, what, what case, do we do? I mean, are you telling us we can't affirm on an alternative ground that you failed to address? Your Honor, what I'm saying is I believe it's consistent with our protocols that are well established that we only deal with the appeal we're given. We deal with what was found by the district court, what was ordered. That you, are correct, you are correct. You are correct that that's all you needed to address in your opening brief. You did not waive anything by not raising other issues in your opening brief. But when the defense proposes alternate grounds for affirmance that were briefed, and which, which you had the opportunity to address in the district court, um, it's a concern. Uh, it, it could be deemed a waiver even. I understand your argument, Your Honor. It's at about two minutes here. I did reserve or seek to reserve about two minutes for rebuttal. 
Um, so if there are no further questions at this time or pressing, I'd like to go ahead and, and save that for rebuttal. I, there is one thing I want to ask you about mm -hmm. before you before you stop, is it's a, it's a concern about this kind of litigation more generally. And that is, if I understand your position correctly, um, you, if, if the case goes beyond the pleadings, you'd probably need to come up with more incidents than just those involving this family, correct? I believe it's likely we would judge, yes. How would, I, you, I would, find, that in part of how would you find those? And I'm particularly Honor, concerned yeah. about the possibility of, of managing discovery of highly confidential files involving other uh, special education students in the district. Indeed, Your Honor. I think that where we would probably start, um, because here we would potentially have some interplay with police records as well when they responded, and that might allow us to do some broader discovery on that first to narrow down things like date ranges. But the other thing that I would point to, since we're dealing strictly with a practice that relates to students who are acting out based on a disability, that would also allow us to narrow pretty specifically what we're looking for because we'd be talking about a very small subset of, of students in this particular case. So that, that's how I would, would approach that. Do you think their families might want to have a say about whether you get access to those? Indeed, Judge. There, there absolutely could be issues of protective orders of how we have to manage it, um, of course. And that's the complicating factor. It goes back to what I said of do we want it done fast or do we want it done right? This is the kind of litigation that, that I recognize is not expedient, it's difficult. It presents I, challenging questions. My, my last question is why, you, you, you've, you've set for yourself a pretty daunting task to plead and prove a Monell claim. Why no individual claims here? Mm -hmm. And Your Honor, the, the reason simply is that we don't think an individual claim fits the facts. It's easier, we, we get it if, if there were evidence that we have that suggests, I'm sorry, may I finish that, that thought briefly? Yes, of course that we have, if we had evidence that suggests that these particular people went into their own discretionary world, went outside of what they were directed to do, what was accepted practice in that district. But here, the evidence we have simply points to this being a problem of, of practice of how they do these supports rather than actions of the individuals where then we're trying to do something to respond to superior. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Anderson. Anderson. Mr. Sachs. <laughs> Nobody told you about the trap door button, right? <laughs> <laughs> May it please the court, Jonathan Sachs, on behalf of the defendant appellee, the Nina Joint School District. This appeal presents one issue. Whether plaintiff's amended complaint states a plausible claim for relief against the district under Monell. Uh, this was not a fast and loose case. The district court dismissed the original complaint without prejudice and provided plaintiff with a roadmap to address the deficiencies that it found. Specifically, the district court pointed out to the plaintiff. Mr. The Sachs, can I jump into the amended complaint? Is there a policymaker for the school district in the amended complaint? There is not a uh, policymaker that term is used and defined under the case law uh, asserted in the amended complaint. The only reference to a supposed policymaker is the school district's acting administrator. Is that Andrew or no? Andrew. The complaint doesn't tell us what the administrative duties are. Under Wisconsin law, an administrator uh, or even like an acting principal does not have final decision-making authority that would make them a policymaker because they report to a superintendent or a school board who have typically been found to be the final policymakers under Wisconsin law. The major point in the deficiency uh, in, that, um, in the complaint, and it was not corrected in the amended complaint, is that it still focuses on one incident where CS's teacher restrained her, which is something that's uh, provided for and permitted by Wisconsin law. Can you ever infer widespread practice 
with one of with one instance of misconduct not when the entire theory raised by the plaintiff is based on the widespread practice not the app at in action in the face of multiple incidents this is not a accident waiting to occur that was never raised that doesn't has never been applied outside of the custodial setting this is the type of case where to sufficiently plead a plausible Monell claim there must be facts to show a pattern more than one instance involving other students other staff members it simply would require too large of an unreasonable inference to take one instance here and for a municipal policy or practice well what why can't the plaintiff say as he is as they allege here here's what here's an incident I know about looks to me like we have indications that the individual actors for the school district were acting according to what looks like a policy as opposed to spur of the moment overreactions and I need discovery into similar incidents involving other special education students within the school district that would make my proof because you all are relying on a lot of summary judgment cases after which which comes after folks have had the opportunity to look for other evidence to support their Monell claims there a plaintiff is not required to plead exact factual information that these other incidents exist specifics about the other incidents or other circumstances but they need to present facts in their complaint that allow the inference to be made to show that such examples could exist and there's no facts in this amended complaint that would show that or infer suggest that such as examples would ever exist through discovery what's wrong with just saying look I know what happened to my daughter and the school district is treating this as perfectly ordinary and routine so if it really is that ordinary and routine there probably are some other similar examples for that to take place there would need to be facts to actually plausibly suggest that those future examples exist in the in this amended complaint that's four corners of the amended complaint here well she's not limited to the four corners of a complaint okay I don't do not believe that without at least alleging it that something could possibly exist or there's other example or having some actual specific facts that relate to other than just mere speculation there has to be something more in the amended complaint okay her her response to that is I'm not speculating I know what happened to my son I know what happened to my daughter a few weeks after this and it looks to me like there's this just in my own family I've seen a pattern of over physical overreaction to an agitated student and not perhaps non-compliant although the complaint doesn't tell us that and 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 the evidence that I've seen and heard about this incident suggests that there was nothing unusual about this that the teachers and administrators and police officer basically treated this as another day at the at the office the fact that the school district did not for example find that anything was wrong with it doesn't you know I agree with you I'm not talking about the internal review I'm talking about the behavior that the plaintiff describes on the scene well assuming the that the plate the behavior described is you know is describing a constant an actual excessive seizure bear let's assume that for right now it does allege that she was screaming in pain right that is that is in the in the amended complaint yeah right and I guess to get to my broader problem here mr. Sachs it is we've got our Wallace case that says we're going to apply a totality of the circumstances test here how do we apply that on a motion to dismiss if you look at the solely on the allegations raised and 
if the court can determine based on its review of case, the case law and the precedent that objectively is not an excessive use of force, and, then and that can be determined on motion to dismiss. How do I decide that on this complaint that doesn't tell me that the, that the child was noncompliant, but just tells us that these three grown men uh, manhandled her for a, a total of a half an hour while she's screaming in pain and confused as to what's happening? The factual allegation is that the school district staff pinned her against the wall for 13 minutes during a, beha uh, a behavioral episode that was caused, was a manifestation of her disabilities. The school... There's more to it than that, right? I mean, yeah, you're, you're right. That's, that's what it says for, the, the, for that period of time. Then we have the police officer, the hobbling, et cetera. And it all adds up to more than, I don't know that 13 minutes is, gets you off the hook by itself if you've got a child screaming in pain where we say on, a, on the pleadings, no problem. With the, in light of the statutory uh, provision that says restrained school can be used in light of those manifestations of disabilities, I still believe it's probably a closer call, but the court could still hold as an alternative ground and look at it objectively find that that was not objectively unreasonable. And what in the complaint tells us it was not objectively unreasonable? The, uh, well, there's the, a la the lack of facts about what actually happened uh, don't provide the additional enhancement to nudge it from plausible to possible. Mm -hmm. Could you, can I ask, uh, one of the things I was curious about with this, what's the problem with her wanting to take the elevator? Well, there, there's no... Uh, there's no there's no facts in the amended complaint to tell us right. about the about the what what the uh, undesirable response was that precipitated this. It's absent, and it's plaintiff's burden to to plead facts to show the existence of uh, the plausible existence of underlying constitutional violation. Well, and, sure, but reading reading her version of the facts, the teacher's response looks almost unprovoked. When you're just looking at the facts and not the conclusions of law and the the way the the facts are described with adjectives, uh, there's limited. There's still nothing. There is it's still insufficient facts to show the underlying constitutional violation. Un, an unprovoked seizure of a of of a, of a student it, that leaves her screaming in pain. The We're supposed to give plaintiff the benefit of favorable inferences from the, this. The amended complaint describes it as a manifestation of her disability. It I, says that she was shoved, this young autistic child was shoved into a wall. That's that's the allegation in the complaint, yes. I, I see my time is up. I would uh, just wait to finish with... Uh, Pointing to this court's precedent that says that pointing to a few incidents of official action is generally insufficient to show the existence of an entrenched policy, entrenched practice with the force of policy. Uh, we would respectfully request that the court affirm. Which case is that from? That is from the Milchstein case that Judge Kirsch uh, was on the panel for. It does last not August. matter which members of the court were on the panel, so I should have said that earlier today. But. Uh, um, and was that uh, summary judgment or motion to dismiss? Milstein was a uh, motion to dismiss, okay. and part of the motion to dismiss covered a Monell claim. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sachs. Mr. Henderson, we'll give you two minutes for rebuttal. Thank Mr. you, Your Honor. Mr. Henderson, can I start with a question? Can you cite one case where we have held that it's sufficient under Monell for a plaintiff to, to plead because this happened to me, it must have happened to somebody else. Therefore, there's a policy in which I get to take discovery. One case. Judge, I'm not aware of one me in neither. which in the Seventh Circuit in which that alone is sufficient. That's why we don't rely on it. But that's what you do here, isn't it? I mean, you say it happened to your client, so it must have happened to somebody else, and therefore there must be a policy, and we need discovery to determine that. And 12b-6 means nothing. We get to Rule 56 no matter what. That's your argument. Your Honor, that's one argument out of three. 
in terms of how we prove the existence of the policy or think we can. What are the other two? Well, as I said, Judge, one is that the district itself in communications with our client has actually referred to this as a practice that they do for chosen reasons, a support that has a specific term of art associated with it, that that is the way the district chooses to respond to a student with this disability issue. And second being then um, the addition of coordination that we see. Uh, you know, Judge Hamilton kind of spoke to that a, a bit earlier um, in, in colloquy that we have things that absent a coordination, absent a practice that had been presumably done before and to be done again, simply don't make sense, that, that they would be irrational lack of reactions to serious things. Um, even just to, to point out one particular example of that, um, when I believe it's Officer Ross, the school resource officer who comes to the scene as Would that, would that uh, happen, Fugley. let me ask you, because time is short, would that happen any time three or four police officers acted in consort with, particular, with respect to one particular arrest because the officers coordinated their actions in effecting the arrest? It must be a policy of the city. May I briefly respond? Yes, yeah. of course. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I just saw my time was up. I, I didn't want to assume. Um, Your Honor, I don't think simply coordination in the actions. I, I'm talking about the reactions and the things that they say to each other that indicate, for instance, being on the same page that seems to relate back to something else. I'm talking about the lack of reaction where you've got something that on its face to a reasonable person is going to appear incredibly excessive even brutal, and that there is no reaction indicating they think it's even out of the ordinary. So, so that's what I'm talking about, not merely the idea that people are working together to do something. Could I ask you, Mr. Henderson, to address, um, nobody seems to have cited it, but the Leatherman against Tarrant County narcotics uh, um, case in which the Supreme Court rejected any heightened pleading standard for Monell claims in our opinion, in White Against Chicago, where we said you don't have to identify other certain instances in your complaint. And, Your Honor, my apologies. I don't have either of those in front of me at the present time. I would time. think Leatherman is absolutely central. It's not in your brief, but it's absolutely central to your, to your position here, that there's no heightened pleading standard for Monell claims. Um, unanimous reversal of, by the Supreme Court of the Fifth Circuit's uh, heightened pleading standard for such cases. And, and Your Honor, really, when we talk about the fixation with um, the idea of repetition, I mean, that's essentially what, how, how I'd argue what that is, is it becomes a heightened pleading standard. It asks us to essentially plead something that really isn't actually necessary to show the plausibility of the underlying claims. Okay, okay thank you, Mr. Henderson. Thank, thank you, Your Honor. Counsel. We'll take the case under advisement and the court will be in recess until tomorrow morning.